Yes. Thanks, Micah. Uh, okay, well, I mean, I'll start by just saying thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's, it's very nice to see that so many people are logging in right now. Um, I personally won't say a very many words. I just uh, I mean, it's obviously trivial to say how exceptional in many ways Tom's contribution has been to our field, uh, which is why we're, we're here today. Uh, I just want to give a very warm uh, thank you to our three speakers, uh, Jeff McFadden, Puri Lopez Garcia, and Andrew Roger for preparing a special contribution for us today. Uh, I'll, I'll shortly hand over the mic to uh, Gaitha Langlois and Sonia Rueckert, our current ISOP and ISAP presidents for a few words. Uh, I just, so Micah has given some couple of practical information. I'll be sharing this, this symposium with him. Uh, you might have seen on the schedule that each of our speaker roughly has an hour. Uh, and so there is this system of breakout rooms that if the speakers want to join them to continue the conversation, it's an option, but not an obligation. We can also just keep chatting on here. Uh, I'll stop here. So, Sonia, Gaita, it's uh, the mic is yours. Well, I, I will go first Thank on you. behalf of uh, the International Society of Protestologists. We are very pleased to be uh, supporting this wonderful symposium. And I'm pleased to welcome our speakers, family, and friends of Thomas Cavalier Smith and um, our um, Tree of Life. Uh, symposium attendees. Uh, I feel um, challenge, I felt challenged to be, be able to talk about Tom's life and work because his contributions were so great. And so I borrowed uh, from a number of, of writings that had been um, put forth on his behalf. And so from time to time, I'm going to quote others' words to reinforce my points. But in overall, uh, we would say that Tom was a man of ideas, or as Tom Richards described his mentor, a polymath of cellular evolution who shaped understanding of the tree of life. Others noted Tom Cavalier Smith, Smith was brilliant, eccentric, kind, a scientist motivated by science for the sake of science. His approach incorporated diverse forms of evidence to bear on evolutionary problems. Tom was willing to question hypotheses, theories, and constantly evaluate evidence and gather more evidence. He radiated enthusiasm, providing ideas and hypotheses framed to be tested. He seemed unafraid to set forth a new idea, defend it, and maybe later change it or even discard it because the evidence showed him some new insights. One person described that the idea that a scientist or indeed any intellectual adventurer could not completely restructure their understanding or even destroy their own previous synthesis in response to new data was anathema to him. Tom was willing to take on new methodologies as technology unfolded. Uh, one of his students described that when overhead transparencies flying into the air matching his lightning speed of delivery, he was uh, not able and, and not at all bothered by just switching over to slides where he could put more information on a slide than any other living being. We were all amazed. Uh, he was very comfortable embracing new techniques and new technologies that provided additional and new evidence of um, cell structure or function and gave him hints to new evolutionary relationships previously undetected. Above all, thinking mattered and searching for the best explanation was always important. Some have said Cavalier Smith's aim was to understand the rise of the eukaryotes, organisms with complex compartmentalized cells. His passion was the huge diversity of single-celled eukaryotes, the protists. His ideas were based on the thesis 
that we cannot grasp evolutionary theory without understanding the dimensions of a cellular system. Uh, he wa Tom wanted always to engage others in thinking about what evidence really tells us, whether it was how the details of cell biology are linked to the evolution of organisms or how we should organize the tree of life. When attending a conference, Tom was paying attention to everybody and everything, talking to undergraduates and established scientists alike, discussing their research ideas and his takes on um, their, their, uh, what they had found, and even engaging young researchers in debates on how to interpret their findings, but always with respect and sincere interest. Some have described the interactions I've had with Tom were warm and considerate. His questions tended to be deep and incisive, not the kind that were answered easily. These were the kind of questions that would ignite furious, passionate debate among different audience members. And during poster sessions, he was particularly cherished uh, because of his willingness to engage with the authors. Many of us share the image of his talks or commentaries and those energetic debates that took place dur during the breaks. Sometimes the coffee breaks just weren't long enough. As an audience member, Tom was equally memorable, sometimes terrifying for a speaker, but never on purpose and always with uh, kindness. Uh, small groups of people tended to accumulate around him, engaged in lively discussion and enjoying Tom in his element. Tom enjoyed an international reputation for his work in writings. He shared his passion far and wide about refining the tree of life. <clears throat> he was willing to tackle complexity and paradox and tangle with other experts and critics of his ideas. And there were always uh, many of those. One person described, you could say many things about Tom, but you could not ignore him. Tom moved in many intellectual circles, was widely respected both for his passion about the organization of life on earth and his willingness to test new ideas. Across his academic career, he received many awards, um, including um, that he was a fellow of the Linnaean Society of London, the Institute of Biology, the Royal Society of Arts, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, the Royal Society of Canada, the Royal Society of London. He was given an international prize for biology by the Emperor of Japan, received the Linnaean Medal for Zoology and the Frank Medal of the Zoological Society of London. So uh, these are just small indications of how much his work was respected. Uh, clearly, celebrating Tom Cavalier Smith's life challenges us all to continue his passion for deeper knowledge about the protists we study. As we will hear later, he stimulated others to delve more deeply into their topic and continually inspired new research studies. In reading the published obituaries and commentaries on his life work, we see a deep respect for both his intentions and his contributions. In summary, what could be more fitting then coming together to listen to scientists inspired to carry on in Tom's tradition and to continue to tackle the complexity of Protestant evolution. And uh, with that, I will uh, turn the mic over to Sonia. Thank you very much, Gaeta. That was very nice, and we have tried hard to avoid overlap, but there might still be some, so please bear with us. Um, I'm here as the president of the International Society of Evolutionary Protestology, but I took a bit more of a popular science view on to Tom because Gaeta covered the science view, so I looked from a bit of a different angle. So you could say that Tom Cavalier Smith was everyone's evolutionary biologist, because even if one does not have a specific interest in evolution, 
or protest or even biology, there's still a good chance that people have come across this work on taxonomy and the kingdoms of life and how this has changed over time, very much influenced by Tom over the past 40 years, if we think about moving from eight to six and then to seven kingdoms. But I will not delve into that because I'm pretty sure we'll hear about that later. When you actually search for Tom on Google, there's a lot coming up, of course. But there was one interesting page that I came across, and that was the Pantheon world. And that looks into visualizing biographies from Wikipedia. I know Wikipedia, but it's still a point to look at, and everybody does it, even though if they do not say it. So, um, and these biographies are only on that Pantheon world page when there are over 15 language pages for that person. So Tom has actually 26. And just to give you an example how widespread it is, um, Persian is one of the languages. Uh, so it's really quite interesting. And the what was on there is different like life stages, but also some rankings. And just to give you a few examples, Thomas ranked the 293rd out of 844 biologists that make it onto the list and 43rd among biologists born in the UK. For me, this is just a sign how far reaching Tom's work really was because I'm pretty sure that most of us will not make it onto that page. So really a sign that his work was well known in the world. So a bit of repetition, but a bit different. So Tom enjoyed sharing his latest hypothesis, which were often visualized in complex trees, even starting on the title page of his talks. And when you were at the conference and you heard Tom speaking and he was on the title page and explained the tree that you could see, and you were happy that you understood what he was talking about, you can be sure that that was the moment when he started changing the tree and you got actually lost when he then moved on from his title page to the next page. So that was quite amazing and happened quite often. And 20 minute presentation slots didn't really daunt him because he would just speak faster towards the end of the talk and could easily fill 40 minutes if another speaker would not show up for whatever reason. If you would share a session where Tom would give a talk, you would often be challenged to actually keep Tom on time, but also not only Tom, also keep the question and answer part after his talks on time, because more often than not, his talks sparked quite debate afterwards. The amount of knowledge and information that Tom wanted to convey is also reflected in the length and complexity of his publications. Of course, not true for all of the publications when it comes to length, but definitely some you can tell actually by the thickness of the volumes, uh, which of, for example, the European Journal of Protestology contain an article by Tom because he published articles with easy, easily 40 plus pages. And I don't know if that works, but I grabbed a few and it probably doesn't work with the camera. But if you look at the stack, uh, yeah, yeah. If you look at the writing, you can probably guess which one has one of Tom's articles in it. So there are really, like I said, not for all of them, and there are others that write long articles, but definitely some of them you can tell that. So Tom had an endless enthusiasm and energy to discuss evolution, the tree of life, protest, science, and the world in general. That a scheduled one hour meeting with a PhD student, as we've heard a lot, could easily turn into a marathon six hour session. At the end of those sessions, the student was exhausted, their brain melting, while Tom was just getting started and excited. Nevertheless, even though exhausted, everybody, and the students especially, would also be very inspired after these meetings. Tom was equally willing to share his broader interests, so he was fascinated by the connections of all creatures, loved nature, from poachers to birds, he was a keen birder, to even woodland conservation, which he practiced with his wife Emma on their property in Cornwall, planting native trees. So I could, and everybody could ramble on for a long time, but I don't really want to do that because I also want to use the opportunity to introduce the speakers that we have. But before I do that, I really would like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers of this symposium 
because the idea of the symposium is born quickly and everybody is excited, but to actually make it happen takes a lot of effort. And therefore I would like to thank especially Laura M for all her efforts and Micah Dunthorn and Thomas Panek to put this together and to make this all happen today. So thank you very much, Laura, Micah and Thomas. So I will go on now to introduce our speakers. So we have three fantastic speakers lined up for the symposium. And I will not get into detail of what their specialism actually is, but rather what their connection to Tom was. And of course, I do not know that all, but I got a little hint from the speakers themselves. So I hope I do what you've sent me justice. So our first speaker will be Professor Jeff McFadden from Melbourne University in Australia. And Jeff got actually in contact with Tom when he wanted to shed some light on the endosymbiotic origins of plastids, which resulted then in a few projects with Tom. And during those times, they enjoyed debating about plastids. They shared bird watching stories and also lots of travel experiences. Uh, Jeff's talk is entitled The Single Origin of Two Membrane Plastids, Nucleomorphs, Kingdom Carbozoa, Plastid Minicircles, and Kingdom Chromista. Our second speaker is Dr. Puri Lopez Garcia, Research Director at the CNRS in France. And Puri's interactions with Tom started with discussions and exchange at meetings and conferences, uh, like for many of us, those points when we meet Tom. And after Tom has visited Puris and David Mariah's lab in 2002, they explored the possibility that amplifying 18S and 28S genes allowed a more precise phylogenetic placement of uncultured eukaryotic lineages. More defining though, was the debate on opposing views on the origin of eukaryotes, which some of us were able to join in on during a podiums discussion that was held at the last ISAP meeting in Cyprus. Oh, Cyprus, Cyprus, can't talk anymore. Uh, in Cyprus, which was really interesting and uh, really nice to follow. Puri and David were also humbled when they inherited actually Tom and Emma's protest collection in 2013. And Puri will talk about the tree of life and the origin of eukaryotes. And last but not least, our final speaker of the symposium will be Professor Andrew Roger from Dalhousie University in Canada. And Andrew met Tom already when he was looking for a bachelor's honors project and a supervisor for that at UBC in Vancouver. In the projects, Andrew attempted to clone part of a soft coral mitochondrial genome. Little sign of where the career would maybe go. He enjoyed the hours, sometimes days of discussion with Tom about the evolution of life according to Tom. And so Andrew was hooked. He continued as a summer student in Tom's lab and was then remotely and unofficially co-supervised by Tom when he did his PhD in Fort Doolittle's lab. Andrew calls Tom the main reason why he is in this field of science. The title of his presentation is The Evolution of Tom Cavalier Smith's Views and the History of Life Over Five Decades. So that was not quite half an hour. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm really looking forward to your talks. Uh, thanks again to the organizers and to Gaper. And I don't know if you want to wait a few minutes or if we just want to give and hand over to Jeff for the first talk. I think we can maybe wait for the hour in case people are logging in just on time for the schedule, if that's if that's okay with everyone. So uh, we will start in nine minutes, I guess. If that's okay. Thank you. 
Laura, may I say something? Of course. <laughs> uh, we, a few of us have been wondering just how many ICEP and ISOP meetings uh, Tom attended and held court. And so if any of you have any historic information about meetings that perhaps you ran and you remember Tom's presentations there. We just thought that would be interesting uh, to know. We know he went frequently to not only those two meetings, but many others. But that's, I just wanted to uh, ask, just let um, Sonia and I know. Thanks. I can share some more stats from the Pantheon World page <laughs> in the meantime. So his pages have 150,000 views, 26 language editions, as I said. There's a historical popularity index, which I have no clue what it says, but it's at 64.5. Um, English. Wikipedia version, of course, the most views, followed by Spanish and then Russian. The pages with the most growth of traffic are the Egyptian, Kabyle, and Irish page. Like I said, it's quite interesting what you can learn on these pages. Um, a lot of names. Yeah, that was most of it, apart from a few other bits and bobs. Thank you. 
All right, I think it is time. <laughs> so thanks for thanks for waiting. Uh, just in case some people were logging in uh, exactly on time for Jeff's talk. Uh, thank you again, Jeff, for accepting to uh, to give this talk. Uh, I I won't talk longer. Sonia introduced the speakers already. So please share your screen and uh, and take it away. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Um... Welcome everybody and, and um, thank you for this huge honor. Uh, let me just make sure you can see my mouse. Can you see that mouse now? I don't think so. I can't. Okay, okay. well, we'll do without the mouse. Um, look, this is really a lovely um, opportunity when Laura asked me to speak about time, I said it, uh, yes immediately. Um, then I realized it was going to be almost my bedtime. Um, but it's lovely to see so many people here. And I, just looking through the gallery view, it was nice to see so many faces. And it made me sad on another note that uh, we're all in our different little places on Zoom and uh, not all gathered together as we might have normally been for a, an ISOP conference or an ISEP conference. Um, I thought a lot about what I would say today, um, and it took me back through a lot of old papers, um, which I, you know, reread probably uh, again that I hadn't read for 20, 30 uh, or more years. And I, I've settled on a number of different topics, um, and these will be divided up into um, Tom's arguments for a single origin of two membrane plastids. Um, I've give quite a lot of 
detail about nuclear morphs because that was um, one of the arenas where I was sort of in the thick of it with Tom and the others and there'll be a lot of personal reflections and, and memories of people and funny stories and things from there. Um, I'm going to talk about the kingdom Cabozoa. Uh, I'll also talk about plastid mini circles, um, a little venture that Tom had and that was very successful. And I'll finish off on uh, the kingdom Chromista, the chrome alveolate hypothesis or whatever you like to call it. And um, the sort of uh, ins and outs of that particular example. Um, this is where I met Tom. Uh, this is the basement of my uh, library at my university and uh, all the journals and the odd folios and things are stacked down there. And, and probably a lot of you are young enough to have never been to a library perhaps. Um, but in these days, um, when we were looking for literature, you had to actually go to the library, um, find the bound journals for the older ones and find the unbound copies of the journals for the newer papers and ferret them out. And you read them in these little dark, dingy places with stacks and, and compactus and things like that. Uh, and then you had to sort of make a decision. Was this paper really interesting enough to pay the money to photocopy it and take home a copy of the paper? Or did you just read it and make some notes and, and throw it back into the stacks? and walk away from it. And at the time I was searching for something that I would like to do um, as starting out my own lab. And I'd seen Sally Gibbs give a lovely talk about nuclear morphs and cryptomonads. And I thought that's exactly my topic. It's got everything I like. It's got microscopy, it's got molecular biology, it's got evolutionary biology, and it looks like a wide open field. And so I went down here into the basement to find out what I could find out about endosymbiosis and the origin of plastids and the papers that I kept coming back to and the papers that I eventually photocopied uh, were many, many of Tom's papers in addition to Sally Gibbs's and, and the Watley's and uh, other people like that. And so I had this virtual relationship for, with Tom for many, many years uh, until I finally got to meet him at indeed ICEP and ISOP conferences. And so the first thing I'll talk about is this single origin of uh, two membrane plastids, uh, which I think is one of Tom's enduring legacies. And, and it was really one of the sort of clear thinking ideas that grasped me um, a lot at the time. Uh, so this is a paper that came out really in 1982. And it struck me uh, today, reading the title, that it wasn't far away from the title of another fairly um, significant piece of biological uh, work. And um, I'm not saying that these two are comparable, but really it's quite an interesting uh, thing that the titles are kind of the same. Uh, and this is also perhaps indicative that Tom published a lot of these papers by himself. They were his ideas, his thinking, his um, thesis, his hypotheses and all these things. And a lot of times they were largely theoretical, but I'll also explain some of them where they actually got into more experimental work, particularly when he moved to UBC. And I'm sure Andrew will elaborate on that opportunity that he took. Um, this paper actually, the 1982 paper, sort of built on this 1981 paper in which he was dealing with the number of kingdoms um, of life. And uh, there's a little note down here on the right here. This is actually part of an ISOC conference in uh, Maryland in the US. And um, so that's another one to add to your tally, um, Gaither, of how many uh, conferences he went to. And the title of the, the paper is kind of interesting because this is the paper that gets cited where Tom really proposed the single origin of two membrane plastids, um, which he then called the kingdom plantae. And that's more uh, recently known um, as the archaeplastida or the, the organisms having the archaeal or the, the really the most ancient of plastids. Um, but the problem with either nine kingdoms or seven kingdoms is that neither of those has the kingdom plantae. And, th and this paper was really confusing to reread, even though it's always cited as um, the kingdom plantae uh, paper. If you go there, plantae is neither a kingdom in the seven scheme or the nine scheme. Uh, and it's only towards the end of the paper when you look at this little part in the discussion. And Tom gives this um, sort of option. So if you actually would like a smaller number of kingdoms than nine uh, for elementary teaching, um, he makes these suggestions uh, to ditch a couple of kingdoms 
and amalgamate a couple of others. And it's only in here that the, uh, the kingdoms uh, Billy Fighty, which are down the bottom there under the kingdom Plantae kingdom, uh, the fourth kingdom, the Billy Fighty and the Viridae Plantae are uh, amalgamated into a kingdom Plantae. And what's kind of really confusing about this, this isn't even a seven kingdom scheme, this is a six kingdom scheme. So you have a, a kingdom bacteria and then um, starting the numbering again with the eukaryotes in the super kingdoms, you have a kingdom fungi, a kingdom animalia, a kingdom protista, a kingdom plantae, which is um, what this paper gets cited a great deal for, and a kingdom chromista. So nine, six uh, or seven, you take your pick in the number of kingdoms uh, in this particular scheme of TOMS. But anyway, the idea here was that all of these organisms uh, in what he called the uh, Viridae plantae, which was really the, the green algae and the land plants, the green land plants, and the bilifida, which was the glaucophytes and uh, the rotophyta, the red algae, all belonged in this one kingdom plantae, largely because they had plastids with two membranes around them. Uh, so this kingdom plantae originated back here in 1981. And um, I'll, I'll sort of walk you through some of the, um, the steps in the acceptance of that to the point where it's now uh, pretty much a widely agreed taxon. So back in this 1982 paper, and I'm really grateful for Alexandre for sending me a copy of this paper. I got um, locked out of my office this week because we're in lockdown number five at the moment. Um, and my hard copy of this that I'd photocopied back in the basement in the 1980s uh, wasn't available to me. And, and through the magic of the internet, um, I put out a call on Facebook and Alexander sent me um, a PDF of this paper. So it was lovely to have access to this again while um, putting this together. And the idea here is that um, Tom really shifted away from um, the consensus at the time, well, perhaps not consensus, but the, the fashion at the time was to have many, many, many endosymbioses for the origin of plastids. And this was um, really kicked off by Merishkovsky in, in his early papers in the start of the 1900s, where he had multiple endosymbiotic events of various prokaryotics into um, eukaryotes to give different kinds of eukaryotic algal groups. Um, Lynn Margulis um, expanded this number and had quite a few different endosymbioses in her paper. And John Raven had a paper in Science uh, in about 1970 that I think from recollection had about 20 different uh, endosymbioses for the origin of plastids. And Tom came really stepped away from this um, and said that you could get uh, the origin of plastids with just two endosymbiosis for the entire plastid diversity uh, amongst eukaryotes. And one of them was to create um, the kingdom plantae or, or the uh, archaeplastida as we refer to them uh, in modern times. And in this abstract here, that's pointed out to, that was just this single event to produce these two membrane uh, plastids. And so he really only needed these two symbiotic events uh, for the origin of all plastids. And this is kind of a recurring theme through all of Tom's work. He invoked these principles of parsimony and he always worked towards hypotheses that had the least number of endosymbiotic events uh, to produce uh, extant diversity of plastids. And we'll come back to that. I think it's been a, a principle that has served him really well, but as also I'll point out some examples that has served him really badly uh, in retrospect uh, with some of the hypotheses he generated. So this is uh, the scheme from that 1982 paper. Um, and I've edited this diagram of his just to focus in on the bits we wanna talk about right now. And it's, it's today, this is really, really classic textbook stuff. So there was some kind of um, organism there, uh, organism A, which is a phagotrophic. Uh, Tom argued that this would be a, a biciliate uh, with two flagella and a single nucleus and that it engulfed um, through phagocytosis this gram-negative uh, photosynthetic prokaryote. And it went into some kind of a phagosome, which is there, the organism C. Uh, and at this point, the endosymbiont was surrounded by three membranes. And this is something that I think Tom got really, really right, really, really early on, that the endosymbiont was a gram-negative bacterium and, and a gram-negative bacterium has uh, two membranes around it. And when it goes into a phagosome, it has three membranes around it. 
And then the important step for this to get to organism D was that this phagosomal membrane disappeared and you would then end up with an endosymbiont, uh, which eventually becomes a plastid, which has two membranes around it. Now, it's, it's kind of ironic that um, 40 years later almost, this is still very much misunderstood in uh, the common uh, textbooks in scientific literature. And I still get students in my endosymbiosis class, no matter how hard I beat them over the head with it, they come back to me with um, the outer membrane uh, is some membrane from this phagosomal uptake event. And they get this out of textbooks. And Patrick's run a bit of a, Patrick Keeling has run a bit of a, um, a score on this. And the, the amount of times that this is absolutely completely misunderstood is, is just frightening um, when this was very clearly explained to us uh, by Tom in 1982. Um, so what is the evidence for those two membranes actually being um, homologous to the two membranes of the gram-negative uh, photosynthetic prokaryote? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll step through a little bit of that later on. But the thing about this is it's another one of Tom's nice mechanistic explanations. Um, because the endosymbiont is no longer in the phagosome, the endosymbiont no longer gets digested and the endosymbiont can then persist in the cytoplasm of this new host, the phagotrophic biciliate. So it's not only sort of his understanding that the gram positive, uh, gram negative rather bacteria have these two membranes and those two membranes then become the two membranes of the uh, original plastids. Uh, it's a mechanistic explanation of how the endosymbiont or prey cell, as it might have been at the time, didn't get digested. So I think this is another example of his ideas of there had to be a mechanism to explain how things um, came to be how they are. And he was really, I think, um, an evolutionary cell biologist. He wanted to understand the cell biology of these things because you couldn't understand the evolution unless you understood how they actually worked in the first place. So there's quite a bit of evidence now that this outer membrane is de derived from the outer gram negative membrane and it's not the phagosome. And I'm not gonna sort of um, go through this in much detail. The first is that this membrane uh, contains a small amount of galactolipids, which are pretty much unique um, to cyanobacteria and to plastids. Um, there's more galactolipids in the inner membrane, but there's uh, also some in the outer membrane. A really um, important piece of evidence is that between the two membranes in uh, a group of the um, kingdom plantae, as Tom envisaged them, or the archaeplastida, the glaucophytes, particularly Cyanophora paradoxa, is that there's a peptidoglycan layer between those two membranes, exactly where a peptidoglycan layer would be between the two membranes of a gram-negative bacterium. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the uh, glaucophytes here, but this is a nice sort of picture of cyanophora paradoxa. And one of the things that's really striking about this, it really does look like um, a cyanobacterium sitting inside a biciliate flagellate, as Tom envisaged uh, that organism B in the scheme that we just looked at. And you can see this particular cyanobact, or this particular plastid, um, is going through an early stage of division. And they often look like this. They look sort of precociously uh, in a fission stage before. And then those two uh, plastids will divide into two and then they'll be parceled into daughter cells. And so this peptidoglycan layer between the two membranes is, is really you know, a smoking gun uh, for this origin of the outer membrane from the gram-negative membrane. And this cyanophora are really a lovely transition form for uh, this part of the idea of uh, primary origin, primary endosymbiosis of plastids. Another really important piece of evidence that has emerged uh, more and more with time, and this is really a long time after Tom proposed this, is that the outer membrane of um, these two membrane primary plastids has uh, a set of proteins that are really very much unique to the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. These are particularly the beta barrel proteins, such as the, uh, the OMPs, or what are known in plastids as the uh, TOX, the transport outer chloroplast proteins, and a, a selection of other um, porin proteins, which are also beta barrel proteins. And these, were, these are very, very common in the cyanobacterial outer membrane, and they're very um, a characteristic feature of the outer membrane of the uh, plant red algal and cyanobacterial uh, plastids. And to the point where we can actually identify lots of homologs of these things, 
Um, this is a little commentary that Gil Van Buren and I wrote um, after the emergence of the um, cyanidioskizon uh, genome here on the right. And if you look at the two membranes of a gram-negative bacterium on the left there, the cyanobacterium, you see uh, um, the TOC75 um, homologue in the outer membrane of uh, cyanobacteria. And you see a number of proteins, which are often uh, referred to as ticks or um, transport inner chloroplast membrane proteins uh, in plants. And you can see across there in the plants and the green algae, um, several of these proteins are conserved and there are also new um, additions to this machinery. And it was also clear in the red algal genome that um, a number of these outer membrane proteins uh, were conserved in the red algal genome. So this is really quite a nice uh, confirmation that um, this outer membrane is derived from the outer membrane of a gram negative bacterium and not a phagosome. Um, and this targeting apparatus is there. Uh, this diagram also shows some ages on there. At the time, we estimated that this um, secondary endosymbiosis could happen later. This primary endosymbiosis on the left there was uh, estimated to be somewhere between uh, 600 million years and 1,600 uh, 1, uh, million years ago. What actually took a really long time was for molecular phylogenetics to show the monophyly of the organisms that Tom um, put into his kingdom plantae. And uh, this paper here came out in uh, 2005. So it really took you know, more than 20 years to be able to get any kind of robust uh, phylogenetic grouping of these organisms together. And it was probably um, because the data sets just using single genes or ribosomal RNA trees or things that, that the signal was too um, obscure after such a long amount of time to group these together. And there was a lot of arguments at the time that Tom was wrong because they didn't group together. Uh, and these were, I guess, you know, phylogenetically flawed arguments because just because something doesn't go together in a tree, as you all know, um, doesn't mean that they actually don't belong to the same clade. Um, anyway, this nice paper came out from, from this team uh, with uh, Nayara Rodriguez Espeleta and uh, led by Franz Lang and, and um, Hervé Philippe at the time. And they were able to assemble a data set uh, here with 143 proteins and uh, 30 odd thousand amino acids. And suddenly bang, the green plants, uh, the green algae, uh, the glaucophytes like Cyanophora paradoxa and the red algae all went into a very, very um, robust clade. And in fact, this has now become pretty much uh, a necessity. And if you don't have a, um, a plantae group in your phylogeny, you've got to be wondering if there's something up with your data set. Uh, so we now really accept this very much as a, as, a, as a given. And this kingdom that Tom set up is, is very, very widely accepted now. I guess the signal was pretty obscure because um, this is a recent uh, paper from Fabian Berkey's group, which showed that uh, this clade and, and Tom's idea of this single um, origin, single primary endosymbiosis to create the primary plastids, the two membrane plastids, happened around about 2 billion years ago, according to the, data, the dating in uh, this Strasset paper, uh, which has got a fascinating set of numbers in it. And I commend all of you to have a look at it. Um, I want to shift on to nuclear morphs as the next uh, topic that uh, I'd like to cover that Tom got involved in. Uh, this is a lovely old photograph that I dug out. Uh, it's uh, me and Tom and Joseph Seckbach and Peter Sitter at the Endocytobiology uh, Colloquium uh, in Kyoto in Japan uh, some 30 years ago. Uh, and all of us looking young and, and spry. Um, I don't think this is the first time I met Tom in person, um, probably because I was brave enough to stand up and ask him to take a photo with me. Um, but I do remember a number of sessions at this conference where we talked um, enthusiastically and long, and this is a lot of people's reflections. And I remember we sat in a bar somewhere uh, in one of those little dingy Japanese bars, and we had a, you know, a very animated discussion about a gazillion things. And Tom drew a lot of schemes for me on um, a napkin and 
I really wish I had that napkin now um, because it would be you know, a priceless memento from those things. But I guess this is another thing that a lot of people have reflected on since Tom's passing that um, he was really generous with his engagement with everybody. And it didn't matter if you were a relatively newcomer as I was here. Um, he had a lot of time for everybody. He wanted to hear what their thoughts were. He, he really wanted to know about what they were working on, what their organism was, what their system was, how they did the experiments, what sort of little um, tidbits of data you had. And I guess for young people, this could sometimes be a little bit intimidating if, you know, um, you go to a conference and, and suddenly this person wants to know about everything you're doing and, and um, you're, you're, you know, perhaps wanting to be guarded. But I don't think Tom was ever um, predatory in that sense. He just really wanted to know and he really had time for everybody. And I'm sure the other uh, speakers will go back on that. Um, I also want to draw attention. Uh, it was Joseph Seckbach um, who promoted the... Um, the extremophile red algae and, and the genome I spoke about before, the Cyanidia schizon uh, genome that was done by um, Japanese researchers uh, came largely through the, the sort of efforts of uh, the spruiking that Joseph did on that. And the guy on the right, Peter Sitter, um, has also passed away a while back. And he was a German cell biologist. And I'll, I'll come to his role uh, and how this photo sort of connected uh, a number of us in, in an unexpected way. And I guess, you know, we're all sitting in front of our laptops at a Zoom meeting at the moment, and we're not sort of uh, at the drink session in front of the posters there, um, sort of shooting the breeze and, and coming up with ideas and eventually forming relationships. And, and I hope that we get back to, you know, live conferences pretty soon, because I think a lot of stuff happens outside the session uh, that is hard to replicate in Zoom meetings. So this will be about nucleomorphs. Um, and there were some really interesting challenges with nucleomorphs and a, an enormous breakthrough was the isolation uh, of the nucleomorph. And this was done in this uh, cryptomonad pyrenomonas selena by uh, this German group, uh, Paul Hansman and Stefan Esbach. And what they were then able to do was actually identify the whole genome of the nucleomorph. And they built an electrophoretic uh, carrier type of this nucleomorph, as well as the, the actual main nucleus of the Cryptomonas perinomonas salina. And um, the way that they did this was they used this cryptomonad, uh, which had a nucleomorph embedded inside the pyrenoid. And so this is uh, an image of uh, this particular cryptomonad. You can see the plastid there on the right. You can see the nucleus there, NU, and the pyrenoid P. And the nucleomorph is that little sort of um, indentation, like a, a finger poking into the pyrenoid. And the German group, uh, led by Peter Sitter and Paul Hansman, realized that this might be a really nice way to get a nucleomorph out of a cryptomonad cell and isolate it. And they were actually able to rupture these cells and then uh, build a gradient, um, a density gradient, and the nucleomorphs inside the pyrenoids would end up in this little band here. And uh, if they made an electron micrograph of that, you can see the um, these uh, purified pyrenoids, and each of those has this little uh, nucleomorph embedded inside that. And then it was simply a matter of digesting away all the proteins from the pyrenoids and, and the nucleomorph and running out the DNA uh, to get an electrophoretic carrier type. And that's lane three in this um, pulse field gel. And you can see that they found three um, very small chromosomes, uh, the, the size of which added up to 660 kilobases. Um, and as I mentioned, this was uh, the group led by Peter Sitter. And there was also a, um, a person involved in this, and that was Uwe Meyer, who's um, a good friend of mine. And Uwe was working on this project uh, with Peter Sitter's guidance. And um, the next step was to really determine if these were uh, the actual whole genome of the nucleomorph. And this was enabled by a paper which came out in the same year um, by Sue Douglas and um, some people at the NRC in Canada. And uh, Michael Gray was uh, the senior corresponding author on this paper. And what they had done was um, done a PCR for ribosomal RNAs, and they showed that there was two different ribosomal RNA genes uh, in a cryptomonad, 
which uh, is unique because all the rest of the eukaryotes just had one ribosomal RNA gene. And they're shown here in this tree. When they um, built this phylogeny, the, the ribosomal RNA gene out of the nucleomorph, uh, sorry, out of the nucleus at the, at the red arrow there um, was not closely related to the ribosomal RNA gene out of the nucleomorph labeled there NM. And the nucleomorph ribosomal RNA gene, its closest relative were, were the red algae uh, for which there were genes at the time. So this was a fantastic insight because it told us that there were indeed two different uh, nuclei in this organism, one which was the nucleus of the cryptomonad and one which is the uh, little relic nucleus of the endosymbiont, the secondary endosymbiont. And so then you were, it was relatively straightforward to take the nucleomorph sequence uh, from these organisms and label these um, pulse field gel electrophoresis things and see that uh, these three little chromosomes in lane three were indeed uh, carry this nucleomorph gene and the larger chromosomes there on, um, in lane four labeled P carry this nuclear gene. And so now we knew where the nucleomorph was, we could get it out, uh, we could isolate it on these gels and uh, we could tell which was nuclear chromosomes and which was nucleomorph chromosomes. And then this is a, um, a more recent photo of Uva uh, when it was awarded the Misha Ishida Prize from the uh, Society of Endocytobiology. And we were at a conference and, I, and I, I frankly don't remember where the conference was. It was maybe in Freiburg, maybe in Tübingen, but it was one of those conferences uh, that we all went to in Germany. And afterwards we were at uh, a nice beer garden enjoying a couple of Weizens. And Uva said, I've got a big idea. And uh, he said, let's sequence the nucleomorph. And I remember at the time, this was um, about the time that the Haemophilus influenza genome had been completed um, by um, Ham Smith and Craig Venter. And it was really genome projects were kind of like a big deal. There was only a couple done. And we all said, yay, that's a great idea. I think Tom was at that meeting, but um, perhaps someone who else who was at that uh, session in the beer garden can remind me if I'm correct or not. So then uh, we decided to announce our intentions. Um, and this is a golden era that you guys, I guess you younger people will never get where you could actually write papers about the experiments you're going to do uh, rather than experiments you'd actually done. Uh, so we wrote this paper, sent it off to Trends in Genetics, and they snapped it up. And we said, we're going to sequence the nucleomorph genome. Um, and we gave a whole bunch of reasons of why we would do that. And one of the reasons was that it would certainly be the smallest eukaryotic genome that had ever been done. And eukaryotic genomes at this time were really quite a challenge to do. Um, and so this little club uh, said we would sequence these nucleomorph genomes. And the idea was that it would be sort of bonsai genomics where we wouldn't have to wade through a lot of leaves on this bonsai tree to actually get to the genes or the fruits. Um, so it would be very good value for money in terms of a sequencing project. And it was just at this time that Tom had relocated um, to Vancouver as a member of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Uh, and he was at the University of British Columbia and uh, joined in this uh, consortium to do this uh, nucleomorph genome sequencing project. And a, a really key player in this was Susan Douglas and his uh, Sue with her husband Drew uh, in Halifax. And I, I think this is probably at the Mahone Bay Yacht Club, just looking out the window there. Uh, and we spent many uh, happy hours in that, uh, in that yacht club uh, enjoying a few wines or beers after sailing. And it was really fortunate that the project involved um, Sue uh, from the Canadian end of this, as well as Tom, because Sue's a real doer and an organiser and a completer. And it was really uh, through her that the project uh, got driven home from the Canadian end and also obviously with, with Uva at the, the, uh, the German uh, side of this endeavour. And it was actually at exactly this time that I um, went to work in Sue's lab for a year. And um, I think it was the day before I arrived on the plane that Sue got um, fired and made redundant by the National Research Council uh, in Halifax in Canada. And I got off the plane and, and there was a sort of a, a somewhat teary Sue saying, uh, I'm really sorry that you've come all the way from Australia, but I've just been sacked. 
Um, and so we had our commiserations and um, we talked about this. And then the next day, a, an enormous grant was announced uh, from NSERC to Sue and to Tom uh, with Uber as, as a, as a co-applicant uh, for over a million dollars at the time. Uh, so this is in the, in the late 1990s and uh, to sequence the nuclear morph genome, um, you know, partly through our fantastic announcement in trends in genetics, I like to think, but uh, it was uh, an enormous grant at the time. And Sue um, talked to me and she said, this is really terrible, Jeff, I have to return this grant. And I said, mm, I think there might be another strategy, Sue. I would get the, um, the papers where you refuse the grant and take them into the National Research Council manager at the time, and we won't speak his name here, uh, and just say, look, I have to, John, return this grant. Um, could you just sign off on the grant return papers? And she did this, and of course, he said, the manager said, oh, no, 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 let's just think about this a little bit more carefully. And in fact, Sue got her job back on the strength of that grant uh, and went on uh, to be uh, a continuing scientist at National Research Council. So a lovely story. You can get a bucket of money and get your job back. Um, so the grant was applied, and, and a lot of the sequencing was done in Halifax on these old sequences here, This uh, the early applied biosystems 373. Uh, where you actually still had to pour a gel on these plates, which cost ridiculous amounts of money um, because they were um, UV transparent or something like that. Um, and then a lot of the sequencing was also done at, at uh, Uber's lab in Marburg. And I believe they did it on these old ALF machines. And I found this picture on the right because you can actually still buy an ALF machine refurbished uh, for 500 bucks. It doesn't look as fresh as this one. Um, but it's remarkable that someone would want this kind of sequencer. And obviously sequencing technology has changed enormously since then, but it was able to be done on these two machines, basically with um, you know, one sort of person running them at, at, at these two nodes. Um, the sequence was all, all completed um, and published with, with Sue and Tom and Uva. And um, the findings were really terrific. Um, as with all genome projects, you know, the, that it seems almost like a fixed 40% of genes are uh, unknown. And then there was this um, arc on the right there with that black sort of semicircle showing the housekeeping genes. And these were all the classic things that, um, that the nuclear morph needed for housekeeping, translation, transcription, protein folding, um, DNA replication and metabolism. But the, the little oranges from the bonsai tree were the little red, um, arc there on the bottom, which were what we called the end product genes. And there was, um, these were really plastid encode, uh, sorry, plastid proteins that were encoded by the nuclear morph. And they were the reason that the nuclear morph needed to be there and maintain all of this housekeeping apparatus to synthesize these, to encode and synthesize these proteins and target them into the plastid to keep uh, this secondary endosymbiont going. So a very successful uh, venture in nuclear morphs with that. Um, and then Tom um, started doing a bit of 18S ribosomal RNA sequencing uh, in his lab in Vancouver and did a lot of you know, prospecting, I suppose, bioprospecting, you would call it, finding uh, unusual um, protists and sequencing their ribosomal RNA genes and building phylogenies and interpreting their morphology. And one of the ones that he got into fairly early on was Colomonas paramecium. And he built uh, phylogenies from these and I think got led down a, a sort of a, a fairly erroneous path. Um, and he suggested in the abstract of this paper that both um, the cryptomonads and the chloroarachnophytes have diverged from a common ancestral chimeric cell that originated by a single endosymbiosis involving uh, an algal endosymbiont uh, related to the ancestor of red algae. So what he was really arguing here was that, that the two organisms with nuclear morphs, the, the cryptomonads and the chloroarachnophytes, uh, originated from a single endo, secondary endosymbiotic event and that the endosymbiont was some kind of red algae. Uh, and the basis of this was in the trees in this paper. Uh, and, uh, and this is one of the trees that, that came in this paper, a neighbor joining tree uh, with a distance matrix for these 18S ribosomal RNA trees. And the nuclear morphs are down there uh, towards the base of the tree. And if we just zoom in on that, 
Um, the idea or well, what was observed in these trees was the, the cryptomonad nucleomorphs there, uh, which are the, tr the three um, groups there. And then there was uh, three chloracnophyte nucleomorphs there. And in a neighbor joining tree, these uh, nucleomorph sequences were united together with a, a bootstrap um, support there of uh, 78. And sort of now we look at this tree and say, you know, danger, danger, uh, really long branches. And, and it was funny because Tom sort of had a bit of form with this. And I'm sure Andrew will talk about this in the, um, the Archizoa hypothesis. But this was clearly, you know, a long branch um, attraction artifact that uh, led him to propose this hypothesis. But it comes back to this kind of overarching principle that Tom was always looking for a, a parsimonious explanation to complexity. And so having two organisms with nucleomorphs with four membranes around them, uh, for him, it was much better to explain that by not having you know, two different secondary endosymbioses, but having one uh, secondary endosymbiosis that gave rise to these uh, different organisms. And the same kind of thinking, I guess, got him into trouble with the kingdom Cabozoa. Uh, and Cabozoa means organisms with chlorophyll A and B, um, Ozoa. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. So what I didn't show you from the 1982 paper was you'll recall that there was only two endosymbioses in that thesis. And one of them was uh, for the origin of the, the kingdom plantae, but the same, um, primary endosymbiosis in Tom's scheme in this paper also gave rise to the dinoflagellates and to the glenoids. And so it looked like this in uh, sort of a, a subsequent version of the figure. You have your um, phagotrophic biciliate there, A, and you have your gram negative uh, cyanobacterium there with its two membranes. And that goes into the, um, the phagosome and, and that creates a three membrane uh, around that. And this is where Tom liked this idea of three membranes and he thought that you could get the dinozoa there on the left by simply inventing chlorophyll C uh, and um, losing the phycobilins. And similarly, you could get the euglenozoa with their three membrane plastids by uh, losing the phycobilins and inventing chlorophyll B and go straight up there to the euglenozoa. And then obviously the bilifida, the cryptomonads and, and the, rota, uh, the rotifida could be there um, on the right. And then the, the verdi plantae um, or the viridi plantae as he, as he changed in uh, the changes made in the proofs to this paper um, would be their origin there. So again, you know, got the, the wrong end of the stick by trying to minimize the number of endosymbioses uh, invoked to explain this diversity. So this scheme minimized the total number of endosymbioses to just two for all of plastid diversity. Um, and you could derive a three membrane plastid of euglenids and dinoflagellates from the primary endosymbiosis by retention of the phagosome. Um, but again, you needed then parallel losses of the phagosome. The phagosome would need to be lost in both the bilifida and um, the green algae um, plant lineage. You also needed parallel losses of the phycobilins uh, in the dinoflagellates um, and also in the line that then went to the euglenozoa and uh, the viridi plantae or the kingdom plantae. Um, and you also needed this weird hypothetical organism on the left there, um, which was neither a dinoflagellate nor anything else, but has now disappeared from, um, from uh, extant organisms, which uh, had the phycobilins and had chlorophyll C. There was some parsimony in this scheme that you only needed one origin of chlorophyll B, uh, which is a characteristic pigment of the euglenozoa and the um, viridi plantae. And I guess in hindsight, you know, we know um, much better now, but um, this was really a scheme to try and minimize the number of endosymbioses. Another very important thing that Tom focused a great deal of energy on and uh, discussion, and, and in fact, this then in itself spawned a lot of research was the heredity of membranes 
and the mechanisms of proteins crossing those membranes. And this is a kind of a fairly sweeping paper in 1999, um, but there's a couple of really key things in here. He got, again, something kind of wrong. Um, and this is the uh, Cabozoa hypothesis, the chlorophyll AB um, protists or protozoa. And what he argued here was that there was an ancestral organism that gave rise to the chlorarachnophytes on the left there and the euglenids uh, on the top right there. And the argument here was that there was um, a non-photosynthetic protozoan that was phagotrophic on the bottom left there. And that engulfed um, basically a green alga. And that went into a phagosome and that created an endosymbiont with four membranes around it, two membranes from uh, the original uh, ancestral primary plastid, and then um, a phagosomal membrane around the outside. And then this membrane just beneath the outermost membrane, um, which was actually the plasma membrane of the endosymbiont. And then he um, invoked that this organism, which would have originally had some kind of a nucleomorph, um, this nucleomorph was lost uh, to create the lineage straight up with the, the uh, euglenids. And it also lost one of the four membranes. And he argued in this paper that it was the periplastid membrane uh, that was lost. And that created the euglenid plastid with three membranes. And the other derivation was really uh, very little change required to uh, evolve a chloroacneophyte organism. So uh, these are a couple of pictures on the right. And he argued that both of these organisms had some similarities. They are typically uniflagellate, um, as those uh, SEMs on the right there show. And they also share a similar um, beta-1,3 uh, starch, uh, sorry, paramyelin um, storage product in the cytoplasm of both of these organisms. But we pretty much know now that these organisms are not at all related. The euglenids obviously belong to the excavata and the, the chloracnophytes uh, along with the rhizarians there. And so this Cabozoa hypothesis um, died a, a pretty quick death, I guess. Um, but again, it was trying to minimize the number of endosymbiotic um, invention type events. So it was a parsimonious uh, explanation of these origins. I'll move on to uh, plastid mini circles. So Tom collaborated um, with Beverly Green in, in UBC and they had, a, I believe Jardot was a student. I couldn't find a, a photo of Jardot, um, but they were looking at for the chloroplast DNA, the plastid DNA of dinoflagellates. And, and um, this was sort of uh, a bit of a holy grail because everybody wanted to have dinoflagellate plastid uh, genomes, but nobody could find the usual sort of large circle uh, with, uh, you know, a hundred genes or so. And, and um, Jardot and, and Beverly and Tom identified these little mini circles. Uh, and there's a picture of uh, the mini circles from uh, dinoflagellate by Adrian Bar Barbrook. Um, and these are pretty weird little genomes. So each gene uh, has its own circle. And you can see there's uh, 11 genes in this particular dinoflagellate in the plastid. And these circles have this little um, red zone, which is a, um, a kind of a, what they call the core region. And these can be protein genes in the case of these uh, green genes on these circles, or they can be ribosomal RNA genes in the case of these blue genes on the circles. There's also circles which apparently don't have any genes in them. They're basically uh, empty mini circles. And these are probably actually um, junk DNA that gets replicated in these circles. And this raised a whole bunch of really interesting questions. How do you um, make sure that every daughter plastid gets a copy of each different circle? Um, what are these mini circles doing? How are they replicated? Uh, the core region's actually very um, conserved across all the different circles. So is there some kind of gene conversion mechanism? A, a real suite of really interesting questions um, about how this came to be. And how does a, you know, an original um, circular bacterial type chromosome break down into each of these individual plasmid type entities? Um, and how do they all get divided up um, eff efficiently into daughter plastids and things like that? There was a little sort of an interesting uh, side spin out of this because these circles actually made it relatively uh, simple 
to develop a transfection system for dinoflagellate plastids. And this is a paper from uh, Chris Howe's lab, Ellen Nisbet, uh, Ross Waller and, and, and various other people on this. And they constructed these um, synthetic mini circles um, with selection genes on them. There's an ampicillin resistance in the mini circle on the left. And uh, they also uh, were able to put in a, a herbicide resistant PSBA gene on this and select um, for the, they could shoot these in with um, a ballistic uh, gene particle delivery gun into these dinoflagellates. And then when they look at the bottom there, you could express um, this uh, chloramphenicol acetyltransferase in blue there. And you can see that it's in the plastic of these dinoflagellates. So these mini circles actually may give us um, the first sort of ability to really get into the reverse genetics and uh, differential sort of reporter genes and things in dinoflagellates. And I, you know, I'd really like to see, for instance, a, a symbiodinium uh, line with a, a GFP chloroplast and another symbiodinium line with an RFP chloroplast in this kind of uh, investigation. I want to wind up in the last uh, few minutes with uh, Tom's Kingdom Chromista. I think, in my view, perhaps one of his most important contributions to uh, the origin and endosymbiosis evolution of plastids. Uh, and again, uh, this is in the 1982 paper. And this is uh, the bottom uh, three cells you've seen here before. This is the origin of the two membrane plastid through the uptake of a gram negative uh, cyanobacterium and the loss of the phagosome. And then uh, that um, kingdom plantae organism, if you like, in this case, it would have been a rotophyte, gets taken up by a eukaryote uh, phagotroph. In this case, Tom actually used the same phagotroph. I'm not sure that this is just being parsimonious with the diagram. Uh, but it's unlikely to have been the same actual organism, organism A there. But that um, eukaryotic organism goes into uh, another phagosome and ends up being surrounded by four membranes and you get the nuclear morph there as the vestigial nucleus of the endosymbiont. And you get a little um, cytoplasmic compartment there between the two membranes of the plastid and the outer two uh, membranes. And then um, in the case of cryptomonads, that phagosome then fused with the endoplasmic reticulum, which is sort of like almost a, a reverse membrane flow through the endomembrane system. And you end up with this chloroplast endoplasmic reticulum. And then Tom envisaged in this paper that the nuclear morph eventually disappeared, um, which is what we're seeing. We see nuclear morphs being very, very tiny and having almost completed all the transfer of genes into the secondary host nucleus. And you end up with an organism with four membranes around it uh, and a chloroplast endoplasmic reticulum like the chromists. And I, I, I was looking at these two drawings recently and I was thinking about um, Ernst Haeckel's embryos. And if you draw things to look enough the same, you can, you can make some pretty strong arguments for uh, homology. And this is Tom's argument for the homology between say a nuclear morph organism uh, on the left with the cryptomonad and a chromophyte on the right there. And basically the only difference is really that the nuclear morph and the cytoplasm and the, the housekeeping machinery in the um, periplastid compartment have disappeared. Oh, and the phycobilins, which are shown as little dots inside those uh, paired thylakoids in the cryptomonad have disappeared and you end up with stacked thylakoids in the chromophyte. So this idea of uh, Kingdom Chromista, which is sort of now more recently um, evolved into the chrome alveolate hypothesis. The, it, it again shows Tom's love of parsimony with a single invention of chlorophyll C, a single secondary endosymbiosis of a red alga to create all of these organisms uh, in this clade, uh, a single loss of the nuclear morph. Uh, you only need to invent fucoxanthin once in uh, Tom's chrome alveolate hypothesis. And uh, you only need one origin of a mechanism for proteins to get across the periplastid membrane. So that's the second membrane inwards uh, from say the chloroplast endoplasmic reticulum. So again, um, you know, this is all about parsimony in, in Tom's uh, hypotheses. And the transport across the periplastid membrane has been an interesting development and one that I like to reflect on. So I was having a conversation with Uva one time and he said, guess what, Jeff, we've discovered the mechanism that um, transports proteins across the periplastid membrane. And I said, gee whiz, that's really fantastic. And he said, yeah, but Tom figured it out 10 years before we did. Um, and, and this is kind of the, another interesting sort of Tom Cavalier-Smith thing that he thought stuff up and published it uh, 
uh, long before anybody else actually got to do the science that proved uh, that that hypothesis was correct. Uwe named this uh, machinery Selma or the symbiont specific ERAD like machinery. Uh, and, and this is a compound acronym for which I'll never forgive him uh, because ERAD means endoplasmic reticulum associated protein degradation machinery. And a lot of this work, uh, this work was initially published by Mike Sommer. I uh, couldn't find a photo of Mike and I'm not sure where he actually is at the moment, but uh, cheers, Mike. Um, and it had contributions from Sven Gould and Jude Proborski uh, in Marburg at the time. And as Uwe said, um, Tom had uh, sort of hit on this idea, uh, it was actually eight years beforehand. And he suggested in this particular paper, which also had the Cabozoa in it, that there would be only two symbiotic events, uh, which are witnessed uh, by the chloroacne and the cryptomonad uh, nucleomorphs. And also that there would be some kind of innovation in protein targeting implied to get across this periplastid membrane. And then he came up later with this scheme, um, which looks something like this. So these uh, sort of wiggly gray lines on the bottom is the inner membrane and the outer membrane of the plastid. And then you've got the periplastid membrane on there labeled as PPM. And then you've got the chloroplast endoplasmic reticulum. So a ribosome would come along, insert a protein with a signal peptide into that ER lumen. And then Tom invoked that in addition to the TOC in the outer membrane and the tick apparatus in the inner membrane, that there would be this other kind of transporter, which he labeled top at the time, and that that would take a protein with a transit peptide and ferry it through the periplastid membrane. And the same transit peptide would then engage with the TOC apparatus and the tick apparatus and eventually bring that nuclear uh, encoded protein into the lumen or the stroma of the plastid of uh, these uh, chromist organisms. And it was this machinery that um, Mike Sommer and Uwe and Sven and, and Jude Proborski discovered. And then this machinery has actually been quite well characterized now. So uh, these are the four membranes around a plastid of, say, a cryptomonad. You've got the rough ER, the periplastid membrane there labeled as PPM. And this machinery composes uh, quite a lot of apparatus uh, with a pore and um, a ratchet engine. And all of these are part of the actual ERAD machinery. And this is actually in the right place in the right orientation if you think about the way the endosymbiosis happened. So it's, it's, a, it's a, very, um, a very, very compelling explanation of how this transport occurs. And so Uber and his team had discovered this in the cryptophytes. And um, then uh, Boris Strepin and Gil Van Duren did uh, a number of experiments in AP complexa, particularly in toxoplasma, where you could knock these things down. And they discovered pretty much the same machinery in the four membrane uh, apicoplast of uh, what Tom called sporozoans or the apicomplexa, uh, as we labeled it in this review that we did. Now, this is quite interesting because these two plastids, both with four membranes, um, would appear to have the exact same transport apparatus to bring a protein, a nuclear encoded protein into this four membrane plastid across this particular membrane, the periplastid membrane. And this is an apparatus that Tom predicted must exist. And then uh, obviously all of these labs uh, figured out the nuts and bolts of the components of this and how it actually had the ability to unfold a protein and drag it in through this pore through the membrane. And Tom said, if, if this apparatus was the same in the chromists, then his hypothesis would be pretty well uh, supported. And, and in some ways, this does support the chrome alveolate hypothesis. Well, not in some ways. I mean, it simply does support the chrome alveolate hypothesis. But nevertheless, the chrome alveolate hypothesis still lies very much as a hypothesis 40, yeah, 39 years on um, and not proven. But I think this is some pretty compelling evidence that these organisms adapted to bringing genes in through a four membrane plastid using the same machinery and apparatus. So this is um, Sven's drawing of the chrome alveolate hypothesis. You've got a cyanobacterial uh, organism is taken up in the primary endosymbiosis, gives you glaucophytes, rhodophytes, chlorophytes, and eventually um, they crawl out or they, they um, get out of the, the water and become uh, the land plants, the embryophyta. Um, and then there's one single secondary endosymbiosis of a red alga to create this whole um, array of lineages, the cryptophytes, haptophytes, heterocons, uh, the apicomplexins like the malaria parasites, and also pachincis and, and dinoflagellates. And also now added to this would be the, uh, those chromarids that have a plastid and the uh, corallicolids 
uh, which also have a relic plastered. Um, again, a parsimonious explanation from Tom that, that really hasn't gained universal acceptance. There's been some pretty decent objections put up to this hypothesis um, from, from all, all quarters of the, of the globe and, and protistology, um, but it's still a live hypothesis uh, and still has some, some pretty interesting um, support evidence. One of the things that I always enjoyed in Tom's papers, once I figured out that this was a, a little staple feature, was to look forward to the envoy. And these were little things that he tacked on to the end of the paper. Um, and they were often comments aside or stuff that he thought up after the paper had actually been set to proofs and he wanted to just jam in somehow. Um, but they were always good. And I have a couple of envoy uh, to remember that. I was thinking about what are the principles he had. He always liked to follow the principle of parsimony, the less sort of ad hocery, the better. Um, he generally considered parallel losses to be more likely than parallel gains because he figured gains required the invention of some you know, sort of new mechanism for doing something and that losses were potentially more likely. Um, he used what I call evolutionary cell biology as his guide and his principle to understanding how something originated. So there had to be a mechanism uh, that would actually uh, work to make this transition form a viable entity. The other thing that's really quite unusual about Tom, I guess, is that he always made formal systematic um, structures, nomenclature for his origin schemes. And because he changed his schemes a lot, he changed the names a lot, and it became really, really difficult to follow this. Um, you had to kind of have some kind of rubrics cube to figure out what the name of each different group was. And if you go back through the papers, it's, it's really kind of almost bewildering um, to see how many names. But he gave them an actual formal name and, and, and a structure. And I think this kind of uh, gave him a handle to talk about the, the new sort of group of organisms that he had, but also um, gave it some sort of enduring legacy. And, and look, he had a, an encyclopedic knowledge of everything. He knew more about biology than anybody I've ever met or talked to. Um, he was pretty much willing to explore all options. Sometimes when I reread the papers recently, I find that there's about four different hypotheses going on in one paper and you're never quite sure which one is backing and which one is actually sort of uh, dismissing. Um, but he was pretty able to abandon a hypothesis like, like we all should be able to, that you know, when the evidence really stacked up against it, he, he was happy to, to capitulate and cave in and, and abandon that one. So uh, you know, kudos to him for that. And he always believed that everybody had something useful. Everybody had some information that he was really quite willing to listen to. And I, and I admire him for that. He had time for lots of people. And he was always down at the posters with the students and things like that. Um, I'll just finish my last communication with Tom. It was, it was not long before he died. It was this January. Uh, and he sent me a, a, an email asking for a PDF of a paper that, he, that Oxford, I guess, didn't subscribe to. Um, and it was actually one of my first papers. It was chapter five of my PhD thesis. Uh, and we went around the, the coast of um, south, southeastern Australia, um, collecting paramimonas species and probably, you know, doing a bit of surfing and stuff like that on field trips as you do. I never found out why he wanted this actual paper. Um, if Emma knows, please um, pass that on because I'd like to know. Anyway, I'm, I'm really delighted to think that uh, he was chasing down ideas uh, right until his, his final day. So hats off to you, Tom. Uh, you were um, an incredibly lovely fellow and you know one of the finest scientists that's been my experience to uh, come across. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was that was really great. Uh, I guess we can. I mean, I don't know if there's any question, yeah, suggestion, comments from the audience. Don't see any way. Yeah, Alastair. Alastair has a question. Sorry, Jeff. That was amazing. That was a fantastic talk, and I really happy to have, have heard, been able to hear it. I just wanted to double check something in the timeline here. In those in those early, um, like 1981, 1982, Cavalier-Smith papers that you alluded to repeatedly, um, we didn't even, do we have chlorarachnophytes then? Did they, did, had they even been discovered? Are we, like what's the uh, sort of timeline there of, of having the full inventory of major 
plastered types versus his his hypotheses at that time? They they were known, but I think the electron microscopy was done by um, it was Richard Norris and I think it was um, Pina from South Africa. But I think that was in 1984, and it was only then that you know it was a, did anyone understand that they had four membranes and a nuclear morph? So no, he didn't have that the chloracnophytes um, at his disposal in that time. Thanks. Any other comment for Jeff? Um, I don't see anyone else jumping in. So thanks, thank you so much, Jeff. This was, as Alastair said, this was a really great, exciting talk. So thank you very much for this. Uh, and so we were supposed to have breakout rooms, but I guess they're not working right now. So if people just want to hang on and then continue the discussion later, I'm sure this will be a uh, very nice. So I guess we'll move on to uh, to Puri's talk now. Uh, yes, so I'm going to share my screen if I can. Uh, okay, share. Can you see it? Mm, yes. Okay. Okay, if you can see it then, uh, well, thank you very much, Laura, and hello to everyone. First of all, I want to thank the organizers and the Proti scientific community, CISO, PICEP, for putting up together uh, this symposium in the memory of Tom Thalia Smith. During this talk, I will present a general, but also obviously very personal overview of how ideas on life evolution, and in particular on the tree of life and the origin of eukaryotes, have evolved in past decades and where they stand now. And I will also ask fundamental questions that Tom himself tried to answer within the limits of available knowledge uh, uh, about, uh, at our time. But many of these things or questions still remain, I think, wide open. Tom was an outstanding character and an influential scientist that left no one indifferent. He had a broad knowledge, many would say encyclopedic, and made enormous contributions to the field of protistology and in particular evolutionary protistology with detailed descriptions of organisms and their, their cell biology features. But most of all, and this has been mentioned, he was a thinker and he was respected for that. He tried to integrate different pieces of information in the form of what seemed to him uh, the most logical hypothesis. These were sometimes controversial and he always defended uh, them with passion. But he was also uh, able and, and, and keen to discuss with benevolence to young students and postdocs. Uh, he was very kind to them. And I witness that it's me here uh, talking with Tom some years ago. So that was very much appreciated. Tom was a naturalist and he was also uh, uh, an in-depth evolutionary biologist who had the ambition like some other scientists before, not only to classify life, he named and renamed many taxa, you only know that too well, but also to understand and explain how all life evolved. Uh, and he had a deep sense of evolution as a process, and this is actually what Charles Darwin tried to depict or reflect in this famous sketch, evolution as a process, rather than a historical phylogenetic tree, Although in the end, if you apply the logic of natural selection and the evolutionary process to an evolution to a global scale, uh, the fact that species derive from other species, etc., led to the inescapable idea that all life forms were historically connected and originated from a first life, a first primitive life form that emerged perhaps in this famous warm little pond that uh, Charles Darwin himself ev uh, evoked. So this idea that extant life forms derived from a single common ancestor, which we now think 
was rather evolved and might have been preceded by one or several life starts that eventually contributed a little bit to the one that took over. So this view was supported since very early by uh, two types of evidence uh, before phylogenetic trees. One is uh, the same common biochemistry, the same building blocks, and second, the use of the same universal genetic code despite secondary uh, uh, variants. So Tom followed the path of previous evolutionary biologists who already in the 19th century attempted to build a tree of life as a historical backbone to understand the evolution of cell and organismal traits from the simplest life forms, bacteria, monera here at the base of the tree in the, uh, at the level of the radix communi communis uh, to uh, more complex life forms um, and to try to understand the, the evolution of cell and organismal traits uh, along this path. And um, so this is a very famous tree by Ernst Haeckel showing exactly that general idea from simple forms to more complex forms, animals, plants, but also a wide variety of unicellular lineages that we now know as protists. So this view where simple life forms, bacteria or monera at the base of uh, some kind of tree are more primitive and from which more complex unicellular and then multicellular lineages arose, persisted until uh, rather late in the 20th century. Um, and this view uh, was actually right or wrong, right and wrong. Uh, it was uh, wrong because of course, simple doesn't mean primitive and bacteria continue to evolve today. But it was right in the sense that it, in the sense that it was logical to think that simple life forms precede complex life forms, and hence that prokaryotes, that at the time uh, equal bacteria, and that uh, encompass simpler uh, cells with uh, the, the genetic material directly immersed in the cytoplasm. Here, transcription and translation are coupled. Uh, preceded eukaryotes, more complex cells with a, a, a different ultrastructure with an endomembrane system defining a nuclear region where, where the chromosomes sit and where DNA replication and transcription takes part, uh, whereas uh, uh, translation takes uh, place in the cytoplasm. So the transition from prokaryotes or bacteria at the time to eukaryotes uh, is not easy to explain actually and constitutes together with the origin of life itself, perhaps a, a, an even more different, difficult question, one of the uh, major evolutionary transitions in individuality. But unlike the origin of multicellularity, which actually happened many times, so evolutionarily speaking, making uh, multicellular organisms is very easy. The origin of eukaryotes and perhaps also the origin of life though, that is less clear, only happened once. And this means that chance, contingency, historical factors may have played an important role in eukaryogenesis. And of course, this complicates a little bit for us, uh, our attempts to uh, decipher this uh, evolutionary path. Uh, Tom had a classical formation. Uh, so Hoke, he was keen on microscopy, ultrastructure, cell biology, and for him, morphology and life history traits were very important. So it was only natural for him in early times to consider that from some sort of universal ancestor, bacteria evolved first because they were simple, simple and eukaryotes derived from them, uh, of course, in the background of evolutionary diversification. So in today's language, we would say that Tom had a 1D view of the tree of life, 1D for one primary domain of life, in his view, the bacteria. And of course, for him, eukaryotes were never at the root of the tree of life. It's impossible. But by the late 1970s, things complicate uh, the landscape or the evolutionary biology landscape, making it more interesting. Uh, with the development of molecular phylogeny, and in particular with work by Carl Woss, uh, who attempted to uh, reconstruct the first universal phylogenetic trees um, uh, 
with the aim to build a natural classification system for all organisms, including prokaryotes and eukaryotes, based on conserved gene markers, in this particular case, in ribosomal RNA genes. Um, and he was actually able to demonstrate two things. One is that, yes, you can make a universal phylogenetic trees where you can place uh, bacteria and eukaryotes in the same tree, and, they make it, and, and these trees make sense. And second, and this was unexpected, he uh, discovered a third group of organisms that he originally called the archaebacteria and later the domain archaea that detach, that were, were prokaryotes, uh, had prokaryotic cell structure, but detached in these trees uh, and were uh, as uh, far from bacteria as they were from eukaryotes. Today, after the addition of many more sequences from both culture and uncultured organisms to these uh, phylogenetic trees, in particular based on ribosomal RNA genes, but also the protein genes, we have validated the existence of these three major domains of life. Um, and since they discovered it, Akia fascinated actually scientists for uh, several reasons, the first of which was their, their um, adaptation uh, to uh, harsh environments, to extreme environments that were either very salty, very acidic, or very hot. But also their study revealed more interesting things. Uh, so despite being prokaryotic, Akia had um, uh, a molecular biology, in particular, all informational processes, the replication, transcription, and translation machineries that resemble more those of uh, eukaryotes than those of archaea. And they also had a, a typical and very unique membranes, membrane phospholipids in particular. So although with time, Tom adopted uh, the molecular revolution and made many phylogenetic uh, trees himself, um, notably to describe the evolution of many different eukaryotic groups, he never accepted very well these differences between archaea and bacteria as being actually fundamental. And for him, archaea, which he always called archaebacteria, were nothing but a derived group of bacteria. So he never abandoned his former 1D view uh, of the tree of life. Bacteria were the only original domain of life evolving from some common ancestor, and eukaryotes and archaea derived from them rather late, actually, during what he, call, what he called the Neomuran revolution. So Neomura group eukaryotes and archaea. And in his view uh, that he evolved with time as well, uh, uh, he thought that there was uh, initially one ancestral bacterium that was a diderm having two membranes, an inner and an out in, uh, 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 outside membrane with a murine layer in between, the peptidoglycan, and that this ancestor was possibly uh, related to the anoxygenic photosynthetic chloroflexy. From this ancestral state with two membranes, this, there was a single loss uh, talking about parsimony, uh, follow, following up uh, the previous talk, um, uh, because it was much more parsimonious to think, to think on a single loss um, that made up all monoderm bacteria and all monoderm organisms, actually. So from this, uh, from this particular group of monoderm bacteria that he thought first uh, would be the actinobacteria, but then uh, he shifted in recent times to uh, the, the um, planktomycetes. Um, he uh, actually thought that uh, the Neomuran ancestor derived, and it would be something uh, that occurred rather late, only 850 million years ago, uh, leading to eukaryotes and then archaea. So the idea is interesting and may seem parsimonious, but it has a number of problems. First, um, although recent phylogenomic analysis based on this time many thousand uh, gene families support a diderm ancestor uh, for a bacteria, chloroflexi are actually monoderm bacteria and uh, cluster well within a group of monoderm bacteria. And 
not uh, are not uh, diderm as in 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 Tom's view. And likewise, planktomycetes, despite having a peculiar membrane architecture, are diderms and not monoderms, and are well nested here within a diderm uh, uh, large uh, clade and bacterial clade. Another problem uh, with this uh, neomuran uh, here, uh, the very late evolution of the neomuran ancestor that was placed around 850 uh, million years ago only. Of course, interpreting the oldest fossil, the earliest fossil record is very complicated and difficult and very often also very subjective. Uh, the oldest non-controversial traces of life are actually fossil stromatolites dating back at around 3.5 uh, billion years ago. You find those fossils uh, in Australia, a bit later in South Africa. Um, Tom uh, said that the first, the oldest prokaryotic uh, microfossils corresponded to bacteria, but archaea, in his view, appear much, much later, around 700 uh, million years ago only. The problem here is that by morphology, you can actually not distinguish, uh, it's impossible to distinguish bacterial from archaeal fossils, uh, unless you have particular features, for instance, in some cyanobacteria. And a late appearance of, uh, of actually archaea is uh, at odds with isotopic traces, very light carbon in particular, uh, at around 2.8 billion years ago, that very strongly suggests that archaeal methanogenesis and methanotrophy had already developed by that time. And finally, uh, a very late emergence of Neomura uh, is also incompatible with the early eukaryotic fossil records, suggesting that unicellular eukaryotes existed at least from 1.5 billion years ago. These acritarchs, and there are also other forms. And perhaps even some algal groups had already evolved by, by, evolved by one billion year ago, more or less. But perhaps the most important problem with the Neomura hypothesis is that um, it uh, proposes radical changes that are very difficult to explain so late in evolutionary history. First, there is a radic radical change of the molecular machinery involved in replication and to a lesser extent transcription and translation here at the base of the Neomura. Um, so why would you change all the DNA polymerases and the informational ma machinery after three billion years of evolution if it was working well? Why? Which were the selective forces for this? This is not very clearly explained. And second, there is also a radical change of membrane uh, composition at the base of the archaea. So Tom here alluded to hyperthermophilia as a selective force, but this explanation doesn't really work well because many bacteria are actually hyperthermophiles, although uh, there are less and, and, and less uh, hyperthermophilic, but nonetheless, they can grow up to 95% uh, degrees uh, Celsius without problem. As, and on the other hand, you had also a uh, far more uh, widespread hot environments on the early earth offering more possibilities for the evolution of hyperthermophily then when uh, uh, three to four billion years ago. So actually these ra two radical uh, different changes in the informational machinery and the nature of the membranes uh, argue rather against this one view and fit much better with those fundamental changes or traits uh, diverging from a common ancestor where they were not yet fully fixed, let's say. Today, we know that this ancestor was rather complex with around 1,000 gene families and had practically modern ribosomes with moderately conserved transcription. However, DNA replication was likely not optimized uh, to the point that some authors uh, allude to an RNA genome uh, nonetheless, there are some replication-related genes and a rather conserved transcription that argue for a DNA genome. Uh, so we can imagine that uh, replication was actually not very well optimized, but that DNA already existed as a, a genetic material. 
and that from an initial pool of polymerases and not highly specialized replication machinery, different families were selected and optimized as archaea and bacteria diverge here from the last common ancestor. And likewise, archaeal and bacteria membrane phospholipids are very different. We talk about the lipid divide. Archaea have isoprenoid lateral chains linked by ether bonds to glycerol 1 phosphate. Bacteria have, in general, a lateral chain generally bound by ester bonds to glycerol 3 phosphate. Uh, there is a bit of confusion here because some authors say in recent times that the nature of the bond, uh, whether it was ether or ester, defines uh, whether a phospholipid is a killer or bacterial, but actually this is not true. And it has been known for a long time that many bacteria use ether linkages, for instance, thermophilic bacteria, but also many others. And also many eukaryotes have a proportion of ether lipids, uh, ether linkage in their lipids. So what makes really the difference between the two types of lipids is the opposite stereochemistry of glycerol phosphate and the nature of the lateral chains. Um, this does not mean that archaea don't make fatty acids or bacteria don't make isoprenoids. They do, except that they don't incorporate them in their lipids and the same uh, occurs for glycerol 3 phosphate, for instance, that archaea can also produce, but they don't put a, that in their lipids. Phylogenomic analysis now suggests that Luca, the last universal common ancestor, had a complete toolkit actually to make the different building blocks for both uh, archaeal and bacterial uh, lipids, although most likely the stereochemistry of the membrane was not yet defined and enzymes to synthesize the two glycerol phosphate stereoisomers likely evolved from that ancestor, allowing for the compositional divergence of the two uh, types of phospholipids, which possibly contributed to the divergence of the archaeal and bacterial domains. And what we have in eukaryotes is a mixed heritage uh, with archaeal-like uh, informational systems and bacterial light membranes and bioenergetic. So energetic. So this actually fits well with eukaryotes being chimeric and fit well also with uh, the first ideas on of symbiosis um, between archaea and bacteria at the origin of the eukaryotic cell. And here is where I speak about Lynn Margulis, second at the, uh, in earlier times another strong character that entertained debates with uh, Tom in particular. So she popularized, and it, this has been mentioned, previous ideas uh, that some eukaryotic organelles, chloroplasts and mitochondria, derive from ancient endosymbiotic bacteria. But later she also proposed in her serial endosymbiotic theory that the host that acquired those endosymbionts was also derived from a symbiosis between a wallless archaeon, archaeon uh, that acted as a host and spirochetes that would become the flagella. Although the spirochete and flagella part is, uh, has no support at all, the endosymbiotic origin of mitochondria from alpha protobacteria or purple bacteria and uh, chloroplast bacteria is now mainstream science and has been shown. It, it, but it results somehow paradoxical that unlike Tom, who accepted and embraced the molecular revolution, Lynn Margulis never, never embraced it, uh, when it was precisely evidence from phylogenetic trees that demonstrated her ideas on the endosymbiotic origin of these organelles. So it's, that's a, a peculiar lesson of history. So at this particular time in the 1970s or around that time, Tom clearly opposed uh, Lee Margulis and endosymbiosis and explained the origin of organelles and eukaryogenesis by long adaptive autogenous processes, starting from cyanobacterial telacoids, which are endomembrane compounds, uh, components. Uh, so, uh, and he eventually accepted uh, the endosymbiosis of chloroplasts and mitochondria. He accepted new ideas, new hypotheses, if evidence came along, of course. But actually, symbiosis was not at odds, as Tom might, thought, uh, uh, might have thought at the beginning, 
with long adaptive processes that might happen during the coevolution of two obligate symbiotic partners, for instance, between the mitochondrial ancestor and its host, before reaching the state of the last uh, eukaryotic common ancestor that we now know possess mitochondria. And furthermore, symbiosis, and on this Margulis was right, uh, may represent a source of evolutionary innovation. Since when you have a symbiosis that becomes obligatory, for instance, after the transfer of genes from one partner to the other with loss in the donor, then you have gene and genome redundancy. There is, of course, uh, multiple compartments, and uh, you can increase the evolutionary rate of some of those genes, evolve new genes and new functions. And all of this can lead to an increase of complexity, such as the one that we can see today uh, in eukaryotes. By the 1990s, uh, several other symbi symbiotic models for the origin of eukaryotes arose that were based on metabolic interactions between uh, prokaryotes or syntrophy, actually. Um, these include uh, two models that uh, were based on more or less the same idea, Cersei's model and the hydrogen hypothesis by Bill Martin and Miklos Muller, which proposed that eukaryotes derived from the endosymbiosis of the mitochondrial ancestor uh, within uh, an archaeon, a thermoplasma-like uh, archaeon in Cersei's model and a methanogen in the case of the hydrogen hypothesis. Uh, with either sulfur or in uh, hydrogen uh, transfer as metabolic basis. At the same time, David Moreira and I proposed the syntrophy hypothesis of eukaryotes that involve a bacterial host, in addition to the alpha proteobacterial ancestor of mitochondria and one archaeon that would evolve into the future nucleus. So these models. Uh, at that time, these symbiotic models, which would imply a 2D view of the tree of life, where eukaryotes were a derived domain, a secondary domain of life, were actually dismissed in favor of 3D models, uh, 3D views of uh, the tree of life, in agreement with the early rooted trees. In these views, eukaryotes would derive from a third Proto-eukaryotic lineage where typical eukaryotic features uh, had evolved, including a developed cytoskeleton and endomembrane system, and the capacity to carry out phagocytosis, which was seen as, as very important uh, because it would have actually allowed the engulfment of the ancestor of mitochondria in a quite late stage. This model was initially supported by the presumable existence of primarily a, a mitochondriate protein, the Arkasua hypothesis that uh, Tom proposed, actually. However, when it became clear that those proteins had reduced mitochondria or had lost them secondarily, and that uh, less common uh, eukaryotic ancestor had, had already mitochondria, the existence of that hypothetical third primary lineage different from archaea was less sustainable. Nonetheless, this type of 3D model prevailed actually as the, until very recently, um, when uh, culture independent methods based on um, metagenom metagenomic analysis and allowing the reconstruction of what we call metagenome assembled genomes, genomes assembled being out from metagenomes, um, uh, revealed uh, uh, a new group of archaea uh, that were collectively called the Asgard archaea in honor uh, to the uh, Nordic pantheon, and that came mostly from anoxic settings, including deep sea sediments, but also freshwater sediments, microbial mats, or in some cases, hot springs. Those archaea contain many proteins thought to be previously only uh, present in eukaryotes, eukaryotic signature proteins, in particular proteins involved in me me membrane remodeling and trafficking. Phylogenomic analysis at the same time placed these eukary eukaryotes within this archaeal group, most likely related to this Heimdall archaeota uh, clade. Of course, with the discovery of the first Asgar archaea, everybody got very excited and uh, we have had quite a number of pro important progress in recent times with the discovery of more eukaryotic signature genes uh, in, uh, in Asgard Archaea, but also with the demonstration 
that the functions of those genes present in archaea are the same or very similar to those observed in the eukaryotic homologs. And this is the case, for instance, of this profiling that regulates the actin system. Um, but also, uh, we have been gaining information about new ASCAR archaea lineages in many different types of environments, mostly anoxic, but not only. And um, uh, these lineages are uh, likely involved in different types of anaerobic respiration and fermentation processes and in the degradation of linear or uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, mostly some are autotrophic too. Uh, so now uh, there are more than 160 uh, almost complete MACs or genomes uh, uh, available for this ASCAR archaea. Um, uh, phylogenomic analysis uh, place again eukaryotes within this group, uh, including Heimdall archaeota and, and related lineages, with more or less support. Uh, but more recent analysis, in particular by Laura M, uh, chairing this session, uh, together with Taise Tema, uh, have had more MACs and more ESPs and more phylogenomic analysis that actually support the placement of eukaryotes within this uh, clade. Metabolic reconstructions of the uh, genomes of, for this archaea um, also suggest uh, that uh, this archaea are actually either um, a, producers or consumers, sorry, of uh, hydrogen. And, and this, of course, touches the ancestor. Um, so uh, this also implies that in their environmental context, this archaea most likely interact syntrophically with hydrogen scavengers or producers. And actually, the first culture archaeal uh, member Prometheus archaeum syntrophicum that was isolated from the uh, from deep sediments by a Japanese team, uh, and that has this type of very funny protrusions called Prometheus archaeum syntrophicum. Syntrophicum is actually a syntroph, um, and uh, it grows uh, in in symbiosis with uh, either a methanogenic archaeon or and or a delta proteobacterium that both can scavenge hydrogen from uh, this Asgard archaeon. So Asgard archaea exist and it, uh, they appear more related to eukaryotes, actually eukaryotes uh, branch uh, within Asgard archaea. So this means uh, that eukaryotes are not a primary domain and this actually favor views of two primary domains that other phylogenomic analysis have uh, uh, supported. So this, of course, has, has uh, two fundamental implications that the archaea and bacteria derive from the last common ancestor, but also that eukaryotes are mergers. They are derived domain that evolved by symbi symbiogenesis through a more or less long evolutionary process that led to a last eukaryotic common ancestor, Lika, which was already quite complex and possessed most of the typical uh, eukaryotic tra traits that we know now in extant uh, protists and, and, and multicellular lineages that had several thousand genes. So, and, and this ancestor evolved from whom? Uh, so the prokaryotic ancestor, as we have seen, uh, are related at least to one Asgar archaeon, possibly uh, associated to this Heimdall archaeota uh, clade, and the mitochondrial ancestor, which recent analysis plays outside the sample diversity of alpha proteobacteria, not particularly associated to Rickettsiales or Pelagibacterales, as has been claimed in the past. When did eukaryotes evolve? Data from the fossil record and molecular dating analysis suggests that the eukaryotes arose some uh, time uh, before 1.5 and 2 on 2 point something billion years ago, coinciding or slightly after the great oxi uh, oxidation event, the oxygenation of, of the atmosphere by the uh, oxygenic photosynthetic uh, cyanobacteria. And the real important questions now are how and why, how, which were the mechanisms, the details of this long evolutionary process that resulted in the evolution of the typical eukaryotic traits that we know now from prokaryotes, and why 
which were the selective forces at play during this uh, evolutionary process. Those are the real open questions uh, that remain so far unanswered and where most models of eukaryogenesis actually diverge. For many models, phagocytosis appeared as a crucial property needed to incorporate the mitochondrial ancestor. So this is the case, for instance, of this phagocytosin archaeon theory of Martin and Etzema ties, uh, the FAT model, uh, where uh, some archaeon evolved some sort of phagocytosis prior to the engulfment of the ancestor, uh, the ancestor of the of mitochondria. But other models. Uh, such as the inside out model, uh, somehow propose a, a very slow phagocytosis process where one archaeon would extend protrusions and progressively engulf uh, associated epibions in some sort of consortium. So the, although the ability to generate protrusions has, has been observed actually in the only culture that we have of one Asgard archaeon, it is unclear how this process uh, actually can occur and evolve through generations uh, from this single consortium. Um, the fact is uh, that many bacteria can generate endomembrane systems. Uh, and even nucleus-like compartments, such as uh, the ones that we can observe in some Plactomycetes uh, uh, species. But also the presence of, uh, the, of eukaryotic, uh, prokaryotic endosymbionts within other prokaryotes has been observed by microscopy in some uh, occasions. Although these observations has, have been criticized as potentially artifactual. But we now know that there are some real cases of endosymbiotic prokaryotes within other prokaryotes and even within mitochondria. And more recently, uh, phagocytosis, possibly involving uh, different uh, machinery than uh, uh, in eukaryotes, uh, has been observed in some uh, uh, bacteria, in particular belonging to this planktomycetes clade. So that phagocytosis is no longer a unique eukaryotic trait. Some bacteria can do it, at least some bacteria. So the other thing is that metabolic reconstructions and the cultivation of the first Asgar archaeon now support the idea that metabolic symbiosis, possibly based on hydrogen or electron transfer, was a starting point for the origin of eukary uh, the eukaryogenetic symbiosis. And this is actually what we suggested in our original syntrophy hypothesis in 1998, where we proposed that eukaryotes derive from a dual symbiosis involving a delta protobacterial host related to myxobacteria, which are complex bacteria um, with several eukaryotic light traits and have sterols and many other things. And the sterol uh, synthesizing machinery is uh, much more related to that eukaryotes than any other, that possibly fermented and delivered hydrogen uh, to an endosymbiotic methanogenic archaeon for its metabolism. And the second endosymbiosis would have been established between the alpha protobacterial ancestor of mitochondria uh, that was uh, a versatile facultative anotrophic organism that could recycle methane the consortium. Our proposal was at the time, but still valid, largely in, inspired by real microbial interactions in nature, microbial ecology, as the, this type of symbiosis, notably based on interspecies hydrogen transfer, I, are widespread in, in sediments and microbial mats, and were especially uh, particularly well known between delta protobacteria, fermentative or sulfate reducers, and methanogens. And some of these interactions can also happen in the cytoplasm of anaerobic uh, proteins in interaction with hydrogenosomes that would provide the hydrogen. So in this type of ano uh, anoxic ecosystems or redox environments, redox transition environment, metabolic symbiosis are actually the norm and uh, not the exception. And be because in the absence of oxygen, you have access here to only weak pairs of electron donors and acceptors. So that most energy metabolic reactions can only proceed if you have a metabolic sink that is usually your metabolic, uh, uh, your syntrophic partner. So I think that it is essential to consider the ecological uh, context when thinking on eukaryogenesis, 
Um, and we think that the eukaryogenetic symbiosis, uh, uh, symbiosis took place in uh, redox gradients in sediments and or microbial mats where different metabolic kills actually coexist, including facultative aerobes such as the ancestor of mitochondria likely was. And taking into account that uh, Ascar archaea were actually involved in eukaryogenesis, we recently updated the syntrophy hypothesis, and we now propose that eukaryotes evolved from a syntrophic consortium established between a sulfate-reducing delta protobacterium uh, that were acted as a host that consumed the hydrogen produced by an endosymbiotic Asgar archaeon that secondarily incorporated a sulfur oxidizing and perhaps also phototrophic alpha protobacterium that recycles sulfur in the assemblage, but was also facultative aerobe. And from this stage, we propose a more or less detailed eukaryogenetic process with the development of an endomembrane system with primarily secretory function and other traits that I'm not going to detail. This model may be right, may be wrong, but clearly distinguishes from other existing eukaryogenesis models in the fact that the host was a bacterium. The rest of detailed syntrophic models propose an archaeal host. We have a variant now of the, um, an update of the hydrogen hypothesis in which now an Asgar archaeon might use carb, uh, uh, CO2 and hydrogen produced by the alpha protobacterial ancestor to synthesize organic flow by um, the reverse flow model by Anya Spang and co-workers who propose uh, that uh, the Asgar archaeon um, uh, produce hydrogen that was scavenged by the future mitochondria that would come a bit later. And the E3 model by uh, uh, the Japanese team, Imachi and co workers, that proposed uh, first the symbiosis established with a delta protobacterium that later is lost in favor of a symbiosis with, um, with a facultative aerobic alpha protobacterium. All these models have advantages and disadvantages, but they don't explain all. And there are major questions open about the nucleus, about the membrane, and about, in particular, the timing of the mitochondrion. So did the mitochondrion first appear uh, early or late? So in other words, was the mitochondrion the cause of eukaryogenesis, as it is in the case of the hydrogen hypothesis, or rather a consequence uh, as it appears in other models where you need to develop first phagocytosis. Um, and a potential answer to this question comes from this uh, study by Alex Pitis and Tony Gabaldon, where they measured the average stem length separating genes of prokaryotic origins inferred to be in link under close prokaryotic ancestors. And on average, genes of alpha protobacterial origin um, have much shorter branches than other bacterial genes or archaeal genes. So they conclude uh, that um, actually uh, there is an older and varied uh, uh, bacterial contribution to eukaryotes different from alpha protobacteria that most likely involve genes involved in uh, signaling and endomembranes. Where do these genes come from? Were they acquired by the Ascar archaeon prior to the mitochondrial acquisition, or is this evidence for multiple sequential symbiosis prior to the mitochondrial uh, final uh, evolution? This brings us to the question of how many symbionts took place uh, or, or, uh, in, in eukaryogenesis. Um, and actually, uh, models invoking more than one symbiont as, uh, are usually dismissed as non parsimonious but evolution does not necessarily fall, always follows the most parsimonious way. And uh, we know that both multiple and successive uh, symbiosis are actually frequent in nature. Another big question is, of course, how did the nucleus evolve, which is a crucial uh, character of eukaryotes, but most models actually don't refer to this uh, crucial eukaryotic feature. So cell biologists suggest that the nuclear membrane derives from the invagination of the plasma membrane. And actually we know um, 
Many homologs of membrane remodeler pro remodeling proteins in Asgar archaea in particular, and sometimes in bacteria too. So mechanisms to explain this process are easy to imagine. What remains much less clear is which were the selective forces for the origin of the nucleus. And here, a popular version was put forward uh, precisely by Tom, uh, uh, that the nucleus evolved to prevent chromosome sharing by cytoskeletal movement. However, this is not completely convincing because many protists have open mitosis, even if this is a derived trait, and they do fine. But most of all, because eukaryotes have powerful DNA repair mechanisms with many polymerases and several and sometimes many linear chromosomes. So you can break your chromosomes and derive a new one, and it works well. So all this argues against this idea as an important selective force for the um, uh, appearance of a membrane. Uh, another popular uh, um, argument was put forward by Martin and Kunin, who proposed that the nucleus evolved to prevent the synthesis of aberrant proteins as introns spread, hence resulting in the uncoupling of transcription and translation. However, introns cannot realistically spread before the uncoupling of transcription and translation so that the process must be exactly the opposite. First, a membrane appears for other reasons. This results in the uncoupling of transcription and translation such that introns can actually spread in the end. And this is actually what proposed our syndrome model. First, the pronuclear membrane appeared as a secretory with a secretory purpose. And then, of course, there is this uncoupling and intron spread, and the membrane is retained in the end to prevent the aberrant synthesis of proteins once introns have, uh, have spread. And the final problem is the nature of the eukaryotic membrane. So for models proposing a bacterial host, this is not a problem because our, uh, eukaryotic membranes are actually bacterial-like, but most models propose an archaeal host, and, and therefore, they imply a membrane transition from archaeal to bacterial phospholipids that it is difficult. So is that transition possible? In principle, liposome, liposomes of mixed archaeal and bacterial phospholipids are stable. And so, uh, and, and so a transition state, stages might be feasible in, in the lab. Um, and also, uh, a recent study by Kafuria and co-workers engineered an, in, uh, an equalized strain which expressed uh, up to 30% of archaeal phospholipids that incorporated in the membrane. And this is taken as proof that this transition can happen. However, uh, such archaeal bacterial transition has never been observed. Um, all uh, examine archaeal, half archaeal membranes. Uh, and that transition also implies a change uh, of all the membrane proteome that have to adapt now to a very different lipid uh, context. And why to change the nature of the phospholipids at, uh, and the whole proteome in a host that was already well adapted to its environment, which we are missing the selective forces here. Um, and furthermore, in this uh, particular experiment, if you express more than uh, and try to incorporate more than 30% archaeal lipids in, in the E. coli membrane, this leads to aberrant cell division and appears to be deleterious. So this is far from constituting proof of a bacterial to archaeal membrane transition. The question is still open. But you could also ask whether this is something uh, that could not have a very high effect on fitness and whether this could actually, uh, uh, such a transition or an intermediate could actually compete in real environmental conditions. And finally, um, we still need to uh, find some type of evidence that an archaeal to bacterial uh, membrane uh, can, can actually be achieved. So these are questions that we still need to tackle. So in summary, the exploration of microbial diversity with the discovery in particular of Asgar archaea have refreshed model on models on eukaryotes, which now favor a symbiotic origin of eukaryotes. Surely phylogenomic analysis, uh, as well as studying the biology and the ecology 
of the closest prokaryotic relative of eukaryotes might help to refine and improve current models of eukaryogenesis. But these models, this most important point, need to detail uh, plausible processes that explain the observed patterns in a realistic ecological context, and not really in particular the origin of the nucleus and the membrane. And here is where comes the important lesson by Tom Cavalier-Smith. He really tried to integrate evidence from a wide variety of sources to build consistent models, and he didn't hesitate to change a view and she had changed in his mind to adapt to new views. And this should be a source of inspiration for all of us. So thanks to Tom for being a model of curious, passionate and integral science scientists and to Emma Shao who worked with him for many years. And uh, here we see the two of them in their, in their lab in, in Oxford, which is, is an image that I find moving. Um, and thanks to, in addition to them, to David Moreira, with whom I share many of these ideas on the origin of eukaryotes and beyond, and also to Laura Emi and the rest of the Dean team in our lab in Orsay, and to the many collaborators and scientists that keep these questions on the origin of life and the origin of eukaryotes, because these are really the really important questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ferry. Uh, that was a really nice overview. Do we have comments for Ferry? So I will start with just like a, to go back to Tom, like, what would you say that there is something, the thing you most agreed on when it came, comes to origin of eukaryotes and the one you most disagreed on? <laughs> Maybe. I think that um, it's, it's not or disagree, um, I, would, I would say that I agree with the intellectual honesty of trying to put all pieces of evidence together. Um, because many people say A plus B makes C or E in this particular case, eukaryotes, without thinking that there might be evidence elsewhere uh, against arguing against uh, a particular model. And I think that we need to try, as Tom actually did, he was right or he was wrong, I don't know, because we have not really solved these questions, but he tried to put all evidence together in a very honest way. And that is not necessarily the case all the time. And I think that that is what I, I appreciate and appreciate it the most. But it, this, this is something that will stay with us for a long time. And this is why I say that we need to inspire in this part of his behavior and, and be, as a scientist and human being. Yeah, very true. Thank you. Other questions for Puri? Yeah, people are being shy. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, Puri, for this. Thank you. Uh, and I guess, uh, if Andrew is ready to jump in, then maybe we can move on to Andrew Roger. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I'll just uh, see if I can get this going. Um, so can are you seeing the slide sorter or are you seeing the actual uh, uh, thing? We don't see your screen for now. I don't oh, think you you're don't. Sure. Okay. No. Uh oh. <laughs> How is that possible? Uh, oh right, that's because I'm not sharing it. It would help if I shared it. That might okay. be why. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thought Don't be selfish. Um, <laughs> all right. Let me just uh, share that screen, and then do this. Uh, come on. Can you see? What yes. are you seeing now? We're seeing the full screen. Uh, okay, great. Great. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, Laura and everybody. And uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, and uh, it's going to be something very different for me because 
I'm going to try not to inject as much of my own personal uh, science into it uh, as I'm going to um, try and do a fairly decent job of reflecting what Tom himself was arguing uh, at the time. Of course, I'm biased. Um, we all are biased, so I'll probably not succeed at that. Um, but uh, first of all, I guess I would just like to start with the, the timeline of Tom's life um, and uh, just use that to build a, a little picture of what Tom's earliest ideas were about the evolution of life. Um, so uh, Tom uh, was born in 1942 in London uh, and his family moved after that uh, to the countryside in Norwich. Um, Tom went to uh, a Norwich Grammar School, a uh, well-known grammar school in the UK, and uh, eventually uh, became very interested uh, in uh, nature. Apparently his mother was uh, cultivated his interest in uh, nature by looking at flowers and things growing in the lanes, in the country lanes in Norwich. Um, Tom uh, did his uh, bachelor's uh, in uh, Cambridge in natural sciences in Gonville and Keese College uh, from 1961 to 64 and uh, and then uh, went to take a PhD uh, in the King's College in London with the famous uh, Sir John Randall, a physicist turned biophysicist who uh, was most famous in his development of um, radar related technologies for the Second World War. Um, but John Randall was a real uh, polymath and became very interested in microscopy uh, and biophysics and how uh, cells actually function. Um, and so Tom joined him in 64 as his student. And Tom was given a lot of freedom during that time to pursue his own interests uh, as uh, John Randall believed in uh, giving students a lot of freedom to develop their own ideas. So Tom's thesis was on organelle development chlamydomonas, and probably the most uh, prominent finding from his thesis was uh, he demonstrated chloroplast fusion in the zygotes of chlamydomonas, which hadn't been seen before, and that was published in a 1970 Nature paper. But uh, <clears throat> after his PhD, Tom actually moved to the Rockefeller University in uh, New York City. Um, see if I can get, I don't, for some reason, my slides aren't moving. Uh, okay, yes. So from King's College uh, in London with Randall, he moved to uh, David Lux group in uh, Rockefeller University in the Upper East Side. Uh, in uh, New York City, and that was in the department of George Pallad, the famous microscopist who uh, also was seminal in uh, discovering how cells were fractionated. So Randall, Randall was very interested himself in developing mutants of uh, ciliary mutants or flagellar mutants in Chlamydomonas, um, but soon after Tom left, Randall actually retired and David Luck, who was at the Rockefeller University, was doing a lot of um, work with uh, mutants, ciliary mutants and mitochondrial mutants. And so Tom uh, went to do a postdoc with David Luck um, at the Rockefeller. Uh, after a few years at the Rockefeller, Tom came back um, to uh, London to take up a position as a lecturer and then a reader uh, in biophysics at King's College, so where uh, he had done his PhD. Uh, and he, for about 20 years or so, he taught uh, a lot of courses um, at King's College. He didn't do as much wet lab research. And Tom's ideas about evolution were first sort of uh, built as in this period as a lecturer at, in uh, King's College. Uh, he, he, his interests expanded way beyond uh, Chlamydomonas uh, to all forms of life. So in 1989, so uh, 20 years after that, Tom actually had the opportunity um, to move to uh, Canada um, as part of uh, Ford Doolittle's CIAR program in evolutionary biology, a program devoted to the 
study of the early origin of life and evolution of the light, tree of life. And uh, Tom had already at that time become quite prominent. So Ford uh, managed to recruit Tom to Canada and the, he went to the UBC Department of Bio Botany. And in this position, Tom was actually able to do a lot more wet lab research. And he actually got two grants very quickly in the early 90s from uh, the NSERC and the CIHR, the Health Research Fund, well, at the time, MRC um, uh, in Canada, and uh, quickly uh, started a big molecular wet lab. And his aims at that time were mainly to look at ribosomal RNA phylogenetics as a way of placing um, protists in the tree of life, as well as investigating um, the nuclear structure of protists Giardia lamblia. Another big milestone in the early 90s, uh, apart from me being his honors student, which uh, is the time when I first uh, came to Tom's lab, was that uh, Tom married uh, fellow scientist Emma Chow. And uh, the two of them uh, shared a common interest in protists. And they, uh, the two of them infused in all of their students, and me included, this incredible enthusiasm for um, the biodiversity of protists. Uh, Tom himself, as was mentioned by others, spent hours and hours with me in his office talking about the evolution of everything. Uh, and I was totally hooked on this. I was a fanboy. Uh, I, I could quote Tom papers like, like they were, like I was quoting the Bible or something. So I was a real convert. Um, and that was really important to me personally. Um, and I think it built a lot of my mental furniture at the time uh, that has kind of sustained me throughout my career. Anyway, uh, after the 90s, we're just gonna skip ahead to 2000. Tom moved to back to Oxford with a, a prestigious NERC professorial fellowship uh, in the Department of Zoology. And it was around this time that Tom's contributions were starting to become really widely uh, understood and appreciated by the international science community. Uh, and because of that, Tom got the uh, International Prize for Biology from Emperor Akihito in 2004. Um, and I was present at the symposium there and Tom uh, delivered very uh, beautiful uh, lecture. This is a picture of Tom uh, there de delivering that lecture wearing the uh, chrysanthemum, which is the um, signature of the uh, Japanese uh, empire. So uh, Tom in the 2000s did an awful lot of things that we will discuss, um, but he started to get other awards in the late 2007. Um, and in 2013, he kind of closed the lab and kind of retired from wet lab research, but that didn't slow him down. He kept on uh, publishing and thinking and attending meetings uh, like uh, nobody's business. So Tom uh, couldn't be slowed down by um, retirement. And then in 2016, uh, he moved with Emma to Cornwall uh, where they, uh, had a big estate that, um, that they had started to develop a large part of their land into a nature reserve. So that's just a, a quick biographical overview. Um, now into the science. Um, so Roger Stanier is a famous uh, Canadian microbiologist from the uh, 40s through to the uh, 70s. And he, uh, he was, despairing often in trying to understand the deep evolution of life on Earth. Uh, and in one of his papers in 1970, he explained that evolutionary speculation constitutes a kind of meta-science. It's the same intellectual fascination for biologists that uh, uh, metaphysical speculation possessed for medieval scholastics. It can be considered a relatively harmless habit, like eating peanuts unless it assumes the form of an obsession, then it becomes a vice. Now, many of you will recognize this unless it assumes the form of an obsession because really Tom's entire career was devoted to evolutionary 
speculation, I would say educated speculation and theorizing, but uh, much of it was speculative as well. So Tom it had a lifelong obsession uh, and I don't think it was a vice. Um, and we can, instead of uh, thinking of him as a, a meta, metaphysicist, we could think of him as perhaps a metabiologist because nobody else um, did the kinds of things that Tom did um, in terms of biological and evolutionary thinking. So Tom, over his career from 1967 to 2021, published uh, 237 papers. Those are the ones at least that are recorded on his CV. Um, many are still submitted, so we can expect that number to increase. And Tom, as many of you know, covered many topics, most famously the origin of eukaryotes, as we've discussed, the origin of plastids, as uh, Jeff was talking about, the tree of life. Um, but it, you may not know that he talked about actually the origin of almost every major group of organisms and of viruses uh, and major uh, organelles, um, genetic structures, uh, he even talked a little bit about um, uh, ecological strategies uh, and the origin of sex. So his, uh, his interests were vast, his knowledge was vaster. Uh, you can see here a picture by John Archibald of Tom in his uh, library at home and, and the numerous books. Uh, and although a lot of these are devoted to bird watching, Tom had an enormous library covering uh, all sorts of historical areas of uh, biology and evolutionary biology in particular. So I'm, I can't talk about all of that. Um, and we've heard from Jeff about his interests in the origin of chloroplasts uh, and from Puri about some uh, aspects of his eukaryogenesis uh, views. I'm gonna try and focus on the eukaryogenesis topic, the tree of life, uh, and some of Tom's main uh, ideas of, uh, of how uh, evolution should be studied. So there were distinctive things about Tom, um, and as been emphasized by Puri just now, uh, and by uh, Jeff and others, that Tom hated when uh, people were theorizing and only using one kind of data. Specifically, he'd often complain about people who uh, only looked at molecular uh, phylogenetic data for evolution or something else. As far as Tom was concerned, you had to consider every kind of evidence. Uh, evolutionary theory, phylogenetics, cell biology, molecular biology, genomics, biochemistry, paleontology, you name it, uh, Tom brought it into his ideas uh, with varying success, but he always tried to reconcile different ideas um, uh, in terms of many different forms of evidence. Um, he also liked to talk about everything all at once. And I think the reason for that was he gave detailed stepwise scenarios about how things evolved. Um, and he couldn't really talk about one uh, aspect of an organism or a cell and how it evolved without discussing its coevolutionary history with other aspects. So here's a quote from his 1981 paper about eukaryote origins. Much discussion of eukaryote origins has been piecemeal, dealing in isolation with the origin of mitochondria, plastids, repetitive DNA, split genes, and meiosis. The great drawback of this approach is that it altogether neglects interaction between the various cellular components, which may be of profound significance for cellular evolution. And that is in fact why Tom's papers uh, usually dealt with not just one particular topic, but top talked about an awful lot of topics all at once, which made them extremely difficult to follow but much more comprehensive than most accounts of the evolution of various traits. The thing that made it even more complicated uh, was, as Jeff has emphasized, that Tom believed that classification should be done at the same time as uh, evolutionary theorizing. So as he was a committed uh, Linnaean evolutionary taxonomist, um, 
And so that meant that he had to construct his Linnaean classifications to reflect uh, the character evolution in his scenarios and the phylogenies that he was proposing. And as he changed his ideas, this also meant that he had to change his higher level classifications because if the phylogeny or the character evolution scenarios changed, uh, the classifications themselves had to change as well. Tom, as we all know, uh, if we ever uh, attended an ISEP or ISOP meeting was uh, always arguing against scientific trends. He was not uh, convinced by, by uh, arguments from authority. He wouldn't accept received wisdom and he always wanted to hear justifying arguments. Uh, so this often took people aback when they first uh, were encountered Tom in question periods after their talks or in discussions. Um, but Tom was always trying to get to the truth of things and he didn't mince words when he didn't agree with something. But at the same time, he was friendly uh, in his objections and it was clear that it wasn't personal. Um, Sometimes when no one would be arguing with Tom, Tom would be arguing with himself because uh, there was many, many areas where only Tom was the one talking about that, uh, the evolution of that particular trait. So he actually argued with his own views. So let's go to the tree of life and the origin of eukaryotic cells, which we've already heard uh, a fair bit about. Um, and I'll just show this overview here from Tom's first uh, foray into the tree of life and origin of eukaryotes in the 1975 Nature paper. And this is a scheme uh, from that paper through to his 2020 um, uh, tome in Protoplasma. Uh, and how you can see some similarities in the, uh, in the diagrams, but much of the, the details of these diagrams have changed over the years. So I'll try to do a a quick overview of how those uh, the early ideas became established and how that ended up leading to this kind of view in 2020. So the backdrop I guess I'll start with is the uh, the idea that um, was brought forth uh, the resurrection of the symbiosis theories for the origin of organelles within eukaryotes that uh, was brought uh, by Lynn Margulis in 1967 in her uh, classic Origin of Mitosing Cells paper. Um, and in that paper and in the subsequent book on the origin of eukaryotes, um, Lynn Margulis developed what uh, became the serial endosymbiosis theory for the origin of eukaryotes. And this is a, a simpler depiction of it from a Scientific American article that she published in 1971. And as, uh, as was described before, um, the, the idea here was that uh, eukaryotes were born out of a stepwise series of symbiotic association between prokaryotic cells. So first here, the origin of mitochondria, then the origin of flagella from spirochetes, and then the origin of plastids from um, blue-green algae, which we now call cyanobacteria. So this idea uh, was very unpopular at first when it was uh, resurrected. I mean, these ideas came from the 19th century with Marischowski's uh, ideas about origin of chloroplasts and Wallen in the US in 1920s, talking about the origin of mitochondria from symbiotes. symbionts. But at the time, uh, the predominant idea before uh, uh, Lynn Margulis came along was that in fact, eukaryotes had arisen autogenously from uh, prokaryotic precursors. So Lynn's idea was uh, by bringing these ideas back together and proposing even more radical version of them, uh, she went against what was the received wisdom at the time. But it did start to get gain traction as, uh, as people started to realize that organelles, some organelles had their own genomes, had DNA associated with them. Uh, and uh, the ideas of endosymbiosis as a way for eukaryotes to originate became more and more popular in the early 70s. Tom was not 
convinced. So Tom's first foray into eukaryote evolution and large-scale evolutionary theorizing were papers in 1975 uh, in Nature, where Tom uh, argues strongly against SAT theory and says, my strongest criticism of the symbiosis theory is that it fails to explain how the eukaryote condition itself, that is the nucleus, evolved. Most proponents of the symbiosis theory do not seriously discuss the origin of the nucleus, but assume it to have evolved gradually from a prokaryotic nucleoid. Uh, instead, Tom believed that eukaryotes evolved autogenously from bacteria, and he thought that the primary selective force behind this was the origin of endocytosis, that is the ability to feed uh, by phagocytosis and pinocytosis. And that follows in a tradition uh, by other microbiologists like Roger Stanier, who had clearly stated in, uh, in the 70s similar ideas. So just to, to show you that that was a, a popular idea out there in the 60s and 70s, I've uh, dug up a paper here by uh, the first mention of this idea by de Duve and Watio in uh, 1966, who basically suggested that bacteria evolved and secreted hydrolases as an adaptation to heterotrophic growth. And then they said that the next evolutionary step may be pictured as a production of infoldings of the cell membrane, allowing the formation of internalized extracellular pockets into which captured food and secreted enzymes were trapped together. The advantages of this development are obvious. It relieved heterotrophy from the ecological requirement for a confined and relatively stagnant environment. At the same time, it made larger membrane areas available for nutritive exchanges and allowed such exchanges to take place efficiently with deep seated portions of the cell, possibly providing in this manner an opportunity for further cell growth and organization. What they're actually describing here is actually the origin of uh, the first uh, proto eukaryotes from uh, a bacterium. Roger Stanier actually independently made similar arguments in his 1970 paper. So these two uh, um, groups actually had independently suggested that phagocytosis was the primary um, ad adaptive reason for the origin of eukaryotes. And that's exactly where Tom, um, Tom's work um, started. So like many of the autogenous theories of the day, Tom uh, believed that you could most uh, sensibly derive eukaryotes uh, from a cyanobacterium that is a blue-green alga, and that is to explain the similarities between uh, photosynthetic eukaryotes and um, the cyanobacteria. So uh, here he has the cyanobacterium losing its wall, becoming what they call an L-form bacterium. Now, people were obsessed with L-form bacteria at the time. Um, these are just forms of bacteria that arise by spontaneous loss of the uh, outer membrane and uh, cell wall. These had been observed to uh, occur in culture in different species. This is just a picture here of a TEM of an L-form bacillus subtilis, lacking the wall of normal bacteria. Um, and so the idea was that if these things arise naturally in nature, it could happen uh, in evolution as a first step to make a naked cell. Uh, that cell uh, has the, then acquires the capacity to secrete enzymes into the environment, that's what these little dots are, and digest prey somehow bringing in the nutrients that are externally digested into the cell as heterotrophic uh, as substrate. And then uh, this process could become more efficient if the host started to enclose the, the cells being digested uh, and so on you, as you develop um, more and more endomembrane systems uh, like we see in normal eukaryotes uh, until the common ancestor uh, in the eukaryogenesis scenario here of a phagocytic pre-alga. So 
Tom not only talked about how eukaryotes could have evolved from bacteria, but he also talked about how what implications that had for eukaryote evolution and phylogeny. So we have the phagocytic amoeboid pre-alga down here, um, and it evolved into the common ancestor of all eukaryotes. In this case, uh, it had enclosed now the thylakoid membranes and insert in into double membranes that we now know as chloroplasts. And the same thing happened with mitochondria. Um, and so we have this ancestral lika that is a proto-alga. And the deepest split now within eukaryotes was with, between photosynthetic taxa like the bangiophyte red algae and the taxa that he believed all derived uh, from the origin of flagella. So animals, protozoa, and so on. Note here that uh, non-photosynthetic eukaryotes actually uh, evolved by plastid loss events. So uh, the, all the heterotrophs over here had actually lost uh, plastids, and there was also secondary loss of plastids up here on this side of the tree. So in this paper and in the 1981 paper that came out after, um, he, uh, he made some important points that actually he kept coming back to in the following 50 years. Um, and one was uh, this idea that the endosymbiosis focused eukaryogenesis theories often don't explain important universal features of eukaryotic cells. Uh, and so he, he says that they're sort of seductive, the endosymbiosis theories are seductive because it sort of suggests that uh, you can get all of a sudden many different features at once um, by endosymbiosis. Uh, and these characters are very difficult to explain by slow and gradual processes. But he also points out that Margulis's ideas and later in other uh, theories in the 90s and the early 2000s, that um, even if both uh, chloroplasts and mitochondria originated endosymbiotically, this does nothing at all to explain the origin of most eukaryotic traits. So in this 81 paper, he lists 22 universal properties. These include nuclear envelope, pore complex, rough ER, lysosomes, peroxisomes, et cetera. So Tom himself, uh, actually in his proposals would always provide a detailed explanation of how each of these features evolved. Um, and so in his view, the any idea about eukaryogenesis that didn't do that was actually seriously lacking. So Tom held out uh, for these autogenous origin theories for quite a long time. Um, but in the late 70s, data was starting to uh, accumulate in the form of molecular evidence that organelles uh, actually were specifically related to bacteria. And this is just two examples here um, from ribosomal RNA oligonucleotide cataloging um, on red algal chloroplasts that uh, showed very close affinities to cyanobacterial uh, ribosomal RNA uh, catalogs. And in the case of uh, mitochondria, the same uh, situation where um, mitochondrial ribosomal RNA sequences look very bacterial and much more bacterial than did the cytosolic um, ribosomal RNA sequences. So this suggested both of these ideas, these papers were consistent uh, with other reports by say Schwartz and Dayhoff with cytochrome C uh, sequencing that the, the Chloroplasts and mitochondria were very likely to be endosymbionts. So finally, in 1983, Tom relented uh, and actually accepted the endosymbiotic origin of both plastids and uh, mitochondria. So this is in two papers in 1983 in an endocytic biology uh, volume. Tom puts forward a new idea, a six kingdom classification of life and a unified phylogeny and the endosymbiotic origin of the mitochondrial envelope. In these two papers, he accepts the origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts from endosymbiotic bacteria. Uh, and he also shifts his view that this, the closest prokaryotic sister group to eukaryotes 
we're not uh, cyanobacteria or proteobacteria, but in fact, we're a new group of uh, bacteria called archaebacteria that had been made uh, famous by Carl Woese in uh, the late 70s by showing that the archaebacteria were quite distinct from other eubacteria in terms of their ribosomal RNA sequences. So Tom took on board a number of features of uh, archaebacteria that had been shown to be somewhat similar to eukaryotes and took a risk uh, like a number of people actually in the field at the time, suggesting that archaebacteria were the closest related um, prokaryotes to eukaryotes, um, at least for the nucleocytoplasmic lineage. And because of this, because he had uh, eukaryotes arising from uh, uh, something common ancestry with archaebacteria. Tom uh, naturally had an intermediate state here of eukaryotes that had evolved prior to the origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts that he named the time archaezoa. So in 1983, uh, Tom's classification of life consisted of superkingdom prokaryota and eukaryota. Uh, with kingdom bacteria and eubacteria and archaeobacteria were subkingdoms. Within eukaryotes, he had uh, kingdoms protozoa, fungi, animalia, plantae, and chromista. And within that, he had this archaezoa kingdom, which is the, a group of eukaryotes that had evolved prior to uh, the origin of mitochondria. So in these ideas that he actually identified um, specific living eukaryote lineages, such as the microsporidia, metamonad protus, like Giardia trichomonas, uh, amoebae, like Entamoeba histolytica, um, as potential uh, candidates for these primitive grade of organization that did not ever have mitochondria. So they branched off prior to the origin of mitochondria. And this fit with the fact that no one could find any trace of uh, mitochondria in these organisms, uh, and they seem to be obligate anaerobes. So now switching forward to uh, uh, 1987, um, Tom's ideas developed a lot further. And I'd say that this 1987 paper is actually the what a keystone paper in Tom's career because it actually outlines most of the main ideas um, that would come back uh, in his subsequent years that he would come back to and uh, embellish and expand upon uh, in subsequent work. And this paper also coming out of an endocytobiology conference, um, Tom interests, very broad interests became fully fledged uh, and all discussed in this one paper. Uh, he talks about the eight major transitions in cell evolution. The first of those transitions is the origin of cells themselves. Uh, and in this he shows, depicts uh, what he calls the inside out cell hypothesis or the ob cell hypothesis that uh, Gunter Blobel, uh, also incidentally at Rockefeller University, around the time that Tom did a, a postdoc, uh, Gunter Blobel was first recruited there. Um, but in the 1980, 1980s, Gunter Blobel uh, published some uh, very important papers where he talked about the origin of cells, and Tom uh, became very uh, converted to this view that, that cells actually originated inside out and that uh, the first cells had um, chromosomes and ribosomes on the outside uh, with sticking to a membrane as substrate. And then over time, that membrane invaginated and then folded back on itself to generate the first uh, gram-negative bacterium or negibacterium, as he would call them. So that was uh, an important Thing that uh, Tom had discussed in this paper, but he also talked about the origin of gram positives or posibacteria. Uh, he talks about the origin of archaebacteria and mycoplasmas by cell loss, the origin of eukaryotes, origin of chloroplasts, the origin of mitochondria, and of course the origin of chromista by secondary symbiosis. So now we're seeing 
Tom in his full-fledged, I'm going to talk about the evolution of everything all at once. Uh, and this paper did so uh, with incredible detail and uh, incredible insights into all sorts of subjects. So as uh, I mentioned before, Tom was not content to just make half hypotheses for the origin of eukaryotes. So in this paper, he actually uh, detailed in uh, quite a lot of um, individual steps the, how individual systems within eukaryotes could have evolved. So in this figure, we're seeing how did phagocytosis first evolve from a, a bacterium secreting uh, enzymes to the environment. This is what the famous wall-less bacterium. Um, and uh, it eventually evag invaginating to, to become more efficient at digesting prey and then engulfing. Uh, and this is sort of a transient phagosome uh, and exocytosis process um, that eventually became a much more sophisticated process. And we're getting through to the endomembrane system in a stepwise manner. So Tom talks in this paper in detail about each of these steps. He also talks about the origin of mitosis and cilia within this uh, paper, leading from these cells that are phagocyte uh, phagocytic with um, a cytoskeleton and chromosomes eventually um, developing internal membrane systems to, such as the nucleus and then eventually flagella. So Tom's tree of life in 1987, you'll notice has become a lot more complicated than his 1983 version. Um, we now have kingdom chromista as as uh, discussed by Jeff in detail. We have kingdom plantae, all the major eukaryote kingdoms. Uh, I'll just draw attention here to uh, an important aspect of this scheme, which is specifically the fact that he argued that archaeobacteria were sisters to eukaryotes. And unlike the 1983 paper, he gave a lot of specific reasons for why he thought that archaeobacteria and eukaryotes shared a common ancestor. Uh, he has this table here uh, cataloging all of the similarities between archaeobacteria and eukaryotes that are not found at the time within eubacteria that made his argument uh, for the sisterhood of archaeobacteria and eukaryotes. So now I'm going to just take a little side foray into how Tom's ideas squared with others uh, in the field. So what as many of you will know, uh, the, the 70s and the 80s and the early 90s were a big time of controversy in the tree of life. Um, there were many different research groups uh, arguing. Carl Woese's scheme, as Puri nicely uh, uh, showed us, had completely shown a, a different picture of how you can understand microbial evolution through ribosomal RNA phylogenetics. Um, and that, uh, that whole, uh, that idea spawned a whole uh, community of researchers using ribosomal RNA to try and figure out uh, deep microbial relationships. One of uh, Carl Woese's arch nemesis was uh, Jim Lake at UCLA, who had uh, his own ideas about how um, the tree of life should be organized and his own ideas about how ribosomal RNA should be analyzed. Uh, and so there were many conflicts between Woes, Woes's um, colleagues and Jim Lake, uh, but also with people like uh, Patrick Fortier. And then uh, some scuffles with uh, traditional systematists like Ernst Meyer. And Tom, of course, was right in the center of all of this controversy. So in 1987, Tom summarized the different proposals for the tree of life. Um, Woes had proposed an idea that, that the three main domains of life had diverged from a, an entity that was much more primitive, uh, maybe had an RNA genome, and had independently evolved uh, features of modern cells. So that progenote hypothesis was uh, a big feature of Woese's early ideas. And it was based on the idea that ribosomal RNAs themselves were extremely divergent between eukaryotes, archaeobacteria, and eubacteria. 
Um, but Woes and Wolf also proposed uh, another idea in 85 that perhaps archaebacteria were actually the ancestral state for um, all life, hence their name, and that eukaryotes and uh, eubacteria were secondarily derived from them. Um, so Tom himself didn't believe that. He believed that the, the bacteria, the root of the tree of life fell within the bacteria because of the uh, ancient fossil record of bacteria. And uh, he didn't see any evidence for eukaryotes in the fossil record until much more recently. And because he thought archaeobacteria were sisters to eukaryotes, that made this uh, likely to be a lot more uh, recent. And then, of course, um, there, he gave a logical other possibility that the common ancestor could have been a eukaryote, and then the bacteria and archaeobacteria would secondarily streamline uh, from a more complicated cellular ancestor. This, of course, has been proposed uh, more recently by various people, including David Penny, Chuck Curland, I think. Uh, something like this has been proposed by uh, Patrick Forter at various points. In any case, uh, Tom's view at the time was that archaeobacteria were sisters to eukaryotes. Uh, and Woes's ideas were either somewhere in between this idea and this idea. In 1989, there was a, quite an innovation that people used anciently duplicated proteins in molecular phylogenetics, uh, Iwabe et al. in PNAS and Peter Gogarten et al. In, also in PNAS, showed ancient duplication proteins could be used to reciprocally root the tree of life. And in those uh, analyses, this one is from the Iwabe et al. paper, you can see that the root of the tree of life, according to these, um, these duplicated, ancient duplicates, was between uh, the bacteria on the one hand and the uh, archaea and back, sorry, archaeobacteria and eukaryotes on the other. Uh, and same for the uh, anciently duplicated subunits of the ATPAs. So based on this idea and based on other similarities on of archaeobacteria and eukaryotes, 1990, uh, Woes decided that he was going to reclassify all of life uh, and he was going to rename uh, the main groups of uh, organisms. So he dropped the U from bacteria and called them bacteria, the bacteria from archaea to emphasize the difference of them from bacteria. And he, just for the hell of it, he renamed eukarya as well. Um, and as well as renaming these and reclassifying these as primary domains of life, he accepted using this a picture and in the text that archaea and uh, eukarya, in his view, were sister taxa. So actually, Woes was quite late to the party in in this uh, in accepting that eukaryotes and uh, archaea were related. Uh, in fact, many researchers had suggested before that, but because of the progenote ideas and the uh, archaeobacteria early ideas, uh, Woes had not officially accepted it until 1990. Anyway, this, of course, ruffled feathers uh, for more traditional systematists. So the, the grand old man of taxonomy, Ernst Meyer, weighed in in a paper in Nature, uh, where he quite uh, nicely stated that uh, the woes at all correctly point out that a system that assigns the same rank to five higher taxa that differ from each other so unevenly is highly unbalanced and unsatisfactory. He's referring to the Whitaker uh, uh, classification of life. Um, so Woes proposes bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. But unfortunately, in Meyer's view, this completely ignores uh, a very important distinction, which is the difference between the cellular differences between prokaryotes uh, that Woes wants, that Meyer wants to call monera, and eukaryotes. Um, so in fact, uh, Meyer is really strongly advocating maintaining the prokaryote-eukaryote dichotomy. Uh, Woes did not respond well to this particular um, argument by Ernst Meyer. Uh, 
and in fact, kind of ignore, not kind of misunderstands what Meyer is saying. Um, Meyer wasn't saying that there may not be three different clades of life. Meyer was saying that if you chop up the tree, you should chop it up into two major groups, a paraphyletic group of archaeobacteria and uh, eubacteria and a monophyletic group of uh, eukaryotes. But, but uh, Woes doesn't seem to quite grasp that in his response uh, and gets a little bit testy about the uh, Meyer's uh, contributions. So he, he basically says, uh, he, he re-explains the phylogeny uh, of that he's talking about. Um, so he says, thus any system that divides the living world initially into prokaryotes and eukaryotes cannot be natural. And by which he means cannot be purely phylogenetic. Tom, of course, has already been writing papers on classification. And so he wanders into the fray and he makes similar arguments to Meyer, but Tom himself had been doing much more detailed classifications on the, the largest scale. The Tom objects um, to the renaming of taxa like Archaebacteria to Archaea. Um, and he also objects to the main uh, idea that you should separate out archaea from bacteria. Um, he thinks that Woese's ideas are too much based on a single molecule uh, rather than the cellular differences between bacteria and eukaryotes. The latter has all the demerits of a one character classification and ignores the numerous fundamental positive characters both in genomic and cellular organizations shared by all bacteria. So what is going on here is really two interrelated things. The question of how should classification be done, both Meyer and Tom are evolutionary taxonomists. That is, they believe that you can have groups uh, such as uh, prokaryotes or, or bacteria in Tom's uh, view, empire bacteria, that are actually paraphyletic, that some of the taxa such as archaeobacteria are more closely related to eukaryotes than other members of the group. That's okay for Meyer and for Cavalier-Smith because in evolutionary taxonomy, the, the classification does not have to just represent the tree. But Woes instead is default, uh, defaulting to a cladistic view of taxonomy that everything that is a named higher taxon should be a clade in the tree. Um, so a lot of what's getting argued about here is just how important are the differences between archaeobacteria, bacteria, and eukaryotes. Woes thinks they're extremely different, but he's got a ribosomal RNA-based view. The ribosome to him is a core molecule um, in the, these cells. Uh, Tom and Ernst Meyer think that all sorts of other features should be, play, be weighed in there as well and that the prokaryote-eukaryote dichotomy makes sense if you wanna look at the largest gulf in cellular diversity. Okay, so that's the kerfuffle over the tree of life uh, circa 1990s. Um, now, just another uh, aspect of Tom's scheme from 1987 that I'd like to quickly look at. And that is the, the idea of the archaeozoa, this group of eukaryotes that emerged prior to the endosymbiotic origin of uh, plastids and mitochondria. So Tom's ideas about the archaeozoa actually gained quite a bit of uh, uh, traction from uh, 1980s ribosomal RNA sequencing of eukaryotes that placed um, these mitochondrion lacking protists the putative archaeozoa as the deepest branches in the ribosomal RNA trees. This is coming from a, a Sogan paper that Tom Ray drew for a news and view. And so this was nicely consistent with the idea of the mitochondrial symbiosis coming in uh, right here, uh, and that the archaeozoa had actually split off earlier. Uh, the rise of the archaeozoa was based uh, at least partly on uh, this idea, but also on the idea that we might be able to get um, a window into the early evolution of eukaryotes by studying the genomes of these putative archaeozoan 
protists. And that actually became kind of a research program for a number of different groups to study the molecular uh, biology of these cells. And Tom himself, when he first came to UBC, had a research grant to study Giardia for exactly that reason. Unfortunately, uh, so by the mid 90s or so, this actually got, this idea took off and it got uh, completely accepted more or less. It was in, you can still find textbooks that will show this idea. Um, the problem was that if we look back at this ribosomal RNA tree, the deepest branches in this tree, uh, in the eukaryote part of the tree are also the longest branches in the tree. So they're sticking out further from the common ancestor than other eukaryotes. Uh, and this actually was a problem uh, because this, uh, this looked a lot like what is known as the uh, long branch attraction artifact that Joe Felsenstein first described in the 70s. And that idea is basically if you have these long branches, uh, you can actually, by some methods of phylogenetic uh, inference, these long branches will be misplaced um, and they'll be attracted together towards the longest uh, branch in the tree. Uh, so this long branch attraction actually turned out to be the case um, for the ribosomal RNA phylogeny, as many of these deep, uh, so-called deep eukaryote lineages, such as microsporidia, uh, ended up, once people sequenced more genes from them, elsewhere in the eukaryotic tree. So we now know, for example, microsporidia are close relatives of the fungi. Another reason why the archaezoa started to fall was because people started to look uh, for particular, to try and falsify the hypothesis, that is, look for mitochondrial genes uh, within archaezoa. And in fact, uh, through the 90s, through the late 90s, early 90s through the late 90s, such genes were found, such as this uh, chaperone and 60 protein, which only ever functions in mitochondria and eukaryotes. Uh, and in fact, Giardia and Trichomonas and other potential um, archaezoa turn out to have these uh, genes of mitochondrial origin. So that suggested that, in fact, these mitochondrion lacking eukaryotes were actually secondarily uh, lacking mitochondria. They had emerged after the mitochondrial symbiosis and secondarily reduced their mitochondria. And more evidence came from the finding of actual organelles in many of these species shown here from a, a paper in the, the, uh, the early 2000s uh, in Giardia that there's a mitochondrion related organelle in this cell. So the archaezoa fell. So Tom actually accepted this very quickly and he was perfectly happy because this data was strong. Uh, and he, he did in fact abandon the archaezoa uh, in the late 90s, based on this data, uh, and actually proposed completely new hypothesis of eukaryogenesis in true Tom fashion. So I can't possibly go through everything. You've probably already gotten a little tired of this. Um, so I'm just going to quickly skip through several decades, three decades of work that Tom did, um, just to remind you that Tom and Emma moved to Oxford in the late 90s. Uh, Tom and Alex Deschman uh, came up with a bold hypothesis to root the tree based on gene fusions to get the eukaryotic unicont and bicont rooting hypothesis that was reinforced um, in 2005 by myosin um, protein distributions. Uh, and during this period, Tom Re revised and re-revised his eukaryotic phylogenies. Uh, in fact, he even re-revised his root of the tree of eukaryotes in 2010 to another root, the euglenozoa. Uh, and also during this period in Oxford, this was a very, very uh, productive period with many of the students uh, in Tom's wet lab uh, finding new protists placing them on the ribosomal RNA tree first, and then in the 2010s using um, pyrosequencing technology to do uh, phylogenomic analyses. So there's an awful lot that I cannot cover. But I will fast forward to, to 2020 to his 132 page paper 
just to, to finish the ideas uh, to do with the origin of eukaryotes and just show you that his picture here in 2020 of the origin of eukaryotes has some very strong similarities that were uh, apparent in the early 80s. The eubacterial tree of, uh, root of the tree of life, archaeobacteria as sisters of eukaryotes, the so-called neomura or new wall uh, organisms. The advantage of phagotrophy being the driving force for uh, eukaryogenesis is still there. And the uh, idea that the neomura are geologically very young, no more than about 850 to a billion years old. Uh, he also uh, repeated in this paper earlier claims, but actually backed them up with more evidence that there have been massive rate shifts in molecular sequence evolution that are distorting molecular phylogenies, leading other people to believe in the root of the tree of uh, life between, say, uh, bacteria and uh, eukaryotes and archaea. But there's also lots of new things as well in here, uh, specifically the Planctomyces sisterhood to the Neomura. Uh, and he also argued against the Asgard archaea as a sister group to eukaryotes. So he has archaeobacteria as still being monophyletic. So Tom, as you can see, isn't accepting what is the latest trends of, uh, and belief systems and gives very detailed arguments. And I invite you to read this paper. Uh, it's, it's every bit as Tom as you can possibly get. I'll just point out that the end of the abstract of this paper uh, has a little interesting Tomism. Uh, after a very long detailed abstract, he writes, we refute numerous wrong ideas about the universal tree. Uh, because he basically ran out of space <laughs> to explain everything that he was going to cover in that abstract. So what are Tom's main ideas uh, throughout his career? Well, the main ideas that we've touched on a little bit here is this idea of quantum evolution uh, based on an idea from Simpson, where there, he talks about major changes in evolution, uh, major changes in hundreds of molecules, for example, all at once as a significantly new form of life evolves. And that is, for example, in the origin of the eukaryotic cell. Uh, the study of evolution on the largest scale is mega evolution, according to Tom. And Tom's own ideas about detailed steps of evolution and how to reconcile alternative scenarios, Tom refers to as transition analysis. Finally, uh, his ideas about genetic membranes and membrane heredity. These are ideas that he originally was influenced by Gunther Blobel in 1980. Uh, and they stayed with him for the rest of his career as he was trying to minimize the number of membrane gains and losses uh, throughout the tree of life and trying to understand where do membranes come from, not just where do genomes from organelles come from. So this, I think, is a depiction of Tom's thinking process. When new data came in, all of these different aspects of Tom's uh, worldview would come into play. They would bounce around the, the importance of different uh, aspects of uh, all of these topics would, would come to bear on his new way of thinking, including his previous ideas. And some new new synthesis would emerge from this entire um, uh, network of considerations. Unfortunately, sometimes it felt like Tom uh, suffered a little bit from confirmation bias. He would interpret many idea, many new data points in terms of his own theory. Uh, sometimes, even if they weren't overly compatible with his own ideas. But I note that this is something that we all do to some extent. So diversity of ideas amongst all of us should hopefully keep us all honest. Tom's talks were a tour de force. They were like trying to catch a train that was going by at full speed from the station. Uh, he originally had transparencies and he would photocopy them and then layer them on top of each other, cut bits out of them, add new bits into them. Uh, they eventually became, as Naomi Fass called them, translucencies. Um, 
when he started to do PowerPoint, we thought, okay, well, maybe life will get easier and we will start to understand Tom's ideas. But no, he developed ClutterPoint, which is how to make slides in PowerPoint the absolute most complicated you can possibly make, with, complete with animations uh, and all done in Comic Sans. So as has been discussed before, and I won't belabor it, Tom would talk to anyone. He was always approachable and he didn't believe in hierarchy. He was extremely generous with his time. He was hypercritical. Many people wouldn't take him seriously because he changed his ideas so often and he con contradicted what they thought were incontrovertible facts. He was also extremely difficult to follow because of all the new names and the new classifications and the changes. Um, but over time, he became well known to several communities of researchers, some in the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research programs, and also by the ISOP and ISEP communities. So Tom at conferences would always sit in the front row taking notes and was one of the first to ask questions, detailed questions. He would praise students, but he'd also vigorously criticize people. Um, he wasn't afraid to speak his mind and refer to his earlier ideas. And this is some nice pictures here that Pori Lopez Garcia gave me that really captured Tom's kinetic nature. So trying to take pictures of Tom turns out to be very difficult because Tom is so energetic and excited at meals that Tom is moving around really fast while everyone is, else is stationary. So that's Tom at a conference meal in Poland. This is Tom uh, in a conference photo. Notice again, he's blurry, you can't capture him. He's moving, he's talking, he's, he's excited about science. We can just zoom in a little bit on that. Everyone else is standing stationary, but Tom uh, is not. But this is a nice depiction of what I would call Tom's science family, or at least some of them. This is a, an ISEP uh, group meeting. Uh, and these people over time, these students grew up with Tom giving talks and talking to them at meetings and learning from Tom's approach. So what have we learned? Well, first of all, I want to name Tom, his own taxon, Tomazoa, and I'm doing it in Comic Sans. Um, but more seriously, uh, I think what I learned at least is that you should always integrate evidence from all relevant disciplines into our ideas. We shouldn't trust received wisdom, always investigate evidence for ourselves. Ignore the hierarchy in science, talk to anyone about their work and keep on learning from them. Uh, talk especially to students and postdocs doing the work and encourage them. Don't be afraid to challenge orthodoxy. Don't be afraid to speak your mind. Don't make it personal. Be daring. Tom was always daring. He was the most biggest intellectual risk taker most of us have ever met. Be kindly and friendly and share your passion for science. And most relevant to today's talk, the allotted time for your talk is a flexible entity. Just in finishing, I'd like to say that Tom's most important lesson to me is that uncovering the history of life on earth is within our grasp. It's, he taught me and I felt it when I met him and when I was around him that this is a grand adventure. We're privileged to be able to find out what the history of life actually was. We can do it now uh, and we should be excited and share that adventure with each other. So Tom, thank you for everything. And with that, I will stop, thankfully. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Thanks, that was, a, that was a really lovely talk and lovely conclusion. So I don't know if it's gonna be very easy to follow up on that, but if anyone has any comment or question for Tom, for Andrew, sorry. Um. I went way over time, but you know, I did that in honor of Tom. That's fine. This is why you were talking last because I knew. <laughs>
<laughs> no, this is this was great. Thank you so much. Um, okay, well, if no one has anything to add to this, uh, yeah, Geta, please. I wanted I wanted to ask Andrew uh, what his favorite example of was when he won the argument. Well, I almost never, I don't know if I was, it was ever really conceded in my presence. Um, but I, in reading all of these um, papers again, um, I was actually secretly proud that, uh, well, proud and a little bit mortified that it was in 2009, um, Alistair Simpson and I wrote a, a dispatch for current biology where we talked about the root of the eukaryote tree and the unicont bicont root. And we brought up some evidence in that, that, that Tom's um, favored ideas were possibly incorrect. And then that, so that within the same year, I think, or maybe 2010 in a paper, Tom uh, proposed his new root of eukaryotes, the euglenozoa root, uh, citing the arguments by uh, Alistair and me from that 2009 paper. And then I thought, well, does that mean that we're indirectly responsible for a new root of the tree of eukaryotes that neither of us believes? <laughs> um, so we won the argument, but we also lost it because uh, Tom had changed his idea to something else that we didn't agree with. But that, uh, that's the way it works. I just wanted to also finally thank uh, uh, Emma Chow, Cavalier Smith, uh, for providing all sorts of information and background um, for, for my talk and for uh, a piece of, that I've written for current biology. So thank you so much, Emma. Oh, you're um, welcome. How do I get in? How do I? You're in. Oh, I'm in. Okay. Well, before we all leave, I would like to thank everyone and the uh, in joining me and the contributor, the speakers in remembering Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. We will. Well, thank you so much again to uh, all of our three speakers. This was really wonderful. Um, I, I don't know if there's any last comments. Uh, I see Juan, you've open your mic. I don't know if you wanted to say something or. I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just very uh, happy to, to have been here. And uh, thank you again to, to all the speakers. It's been, it's been awesome. Yeah. And. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again, everyone. And I guess we will we'll stop here. And as you've noticed,